Hi, my name's Steve Mango. I'm an actor, a business owner, and I was a four-year parishioner of the Church of Scientology Celebrity Center in Hollywood. Hi, my name is Jeff Myers. I'm a lawyer, and I'm an Episcopalian, and I'm Steve's husband. I came in there hoping to find spiritual fulfillment and get some guidance in my acting career. So over the course of four years, I donated close to $50,000 to the Church of Scientology. They lied to me, they manipulated me, and they took advantage of me. You have to have money to be a Scientologist, regardless of what they want to tell you. Do you have any investments? No. Do you have any gold bullion? No. He wants me to call my grandmother and ask my grandmother to donate $3,200. She's like, look, I need you to donate the total amount of your checking account. They got my social security number. They got, you know, all my financial information. And all of them were running credit apps at the same time. We have people higher up in American Express and other financial institutions who are Scientologists and they can underwrite and approve your credit card for the amount of credit that we need for you to be able to go clear. They'd show up to my house. They would knock on my door. Telemarketers have nothing on these people. They would call uh, 40 times a day. Give up on being an actor and become a staff member now. So they lay it on really hard. They put the CR contract and the pen in my hand. You're in on the greatest push in the last 2,500 years. You're gonna be an auditor and you're gonna help us clear this planet. So just listen to us, trust us, and sign the contract. Now this program is basically manual labor. You may be digging ditches for Scientology. You may be painting walls. You're doing manual hard labor from sunup to sundown. They're yelling at me, you are a horrible, disgusting, excuse for a human being. You shouldn't even be living right now because you don't contribute anything into this world. Steve's a pussy. He needs to grow a pair of balls and handle and confront what the condition on this planet is and he can't do that. He's just a sissy. He's not gonna be able to be in the sea organization. Sign the contract and we'll handle getting rid of your apartment, your car. You give up on all your artistic dreams. Scientology makes you forget all about them. They suggest to women to have an abortion if they get pregnant, if they're a Sea Org member, because they believe a kid's just going to hold back a woman from their mission. The way that I got into Scientology wasn't through family or friends. I'm not a second generation Scientologist. So it was about August of 2009 that I was reading backstage one night and I come across an ad. And the ad was breaking into the industry. And of course that caught my attention, that's what I'm looking for, I'm looking to break into the entertainment industry. And it said, um, breaking into the industry, $20 including a book by L. Ron Hubbard called The Problems of Work. And the ad listed how, you know, you're going to be able to learn how to um, get an agent, how to get a manager, how to get in front of casting directors. Those are all things every actor is looking for when they come to L.A. So it's really enticing. But I knew about L. Ron Hubbard. I didn't know much, but I just knew that he ran the Church of Scientology and he was the founder. But I didn't really know much about, you know, what the church actually was. But, you know, you see them every, you know, five minutes when you're driving through Hollywood. You come across the Los Angeles or you come across a celebrity center, and you know, they have just various different like front groups and different things all through Hollywood. So, I mean, I was kind of familiar, familiar with the idea. And I knew that Scientology had a really large celebrity following. And I was kind of curious. I knew it might have been like a bait and switch sort of thing, but I figured let me just give it a shot and go, and there's nothing to lose, it's only 20 bucks. So um, at the time, I didn't have a car. I had to take the bus to the Celebrity Center. But the bus stopped about a half a mile before the Celebrity Center, so I left kind of early. So I'm starting to walk on, you know, the pathway down, you know, Franklin to go to the Celebrity Center in Hollywood. And I get a call on my cell phone at about 6.30. And the guy was saying, um, where are you? Are you almost here? We have your seat reserved for you and we're waiting for you and we'd really like to speak to you. And I'm thinking, well, that's kind of strange because, you know, I'm still like a half hour you know, early and I'm almost there. So I just thought it was kind of strange just given the fact that it was only like a $20 workshop. So I meet with one of the staff members who takes me out onto one of their balconies and he wants to talk to me a little bit about my career, he says. So, you know, he's just asking me how long I've been in LA and how long I've been pursuing my acting career. Then he immediately begins to sell me the um, whole series of workshops 
I've only been in Scientology like five minutes and they're already selling me a whole, you know, couple hundred dollars worth of um, classes. So I tell them, you know, no, I'm not really, you know, interested. I don't really have the money right now. And then he starts to, um, you know, change his sales pitch a little bit. And he says, well, you know, Giovanni Rabisi? Well, his dad works here and he's actually a Scientologist. And, you know, we have a number of celebrities that come here that you're going to be able to see, like Tom Cruise. We have Kirstie Alley. We have, you know, John Travolta. We just have, you know, tons of celebrities who come here, and they've gone and helped their workshops like these. And we're going to be able to help you. So I just said, you know, I don't really have the money right now. Let me just go to the workshop. So I'm sitting in the workshop, and there's only, like, a couple other people there. And um, the actor... Gino comes to the front and he starts um, talking a little bit about like his credits in the industry and the different shows that he's worked on and kind of just like setting up his like credibility. So um, he starts like just talking about just like very basic elementary ways that you can get started as an actor, like mail your headshots to agents and um, try to take workshops around town. Now this was like nothing that was really worth paying for to hear because I already knew all these sort of things. But then he turns the table over to one of the celebrity center workers who comes to the front and he starts talking about various Scientology principles. And everyone's like happy and whatnot. And then he starts talking about um, your mind and how there's a part of your mind that's holding you back. And in Scientology, you can learn about this part of the mind and how your fears and your pain and all different things are stored in this part of the mind. And you can take this two-week course, and it's 50 bucks, it's part-time, and you're going to learn about um, this and how you can get rid of it, and, you know, it's the best investment you can make. Who wants to sign up for the course? And I sign up for the course with another guy. They take me and the guy into this theater room, and they lock the door. So now we're stuck in this dark theater, and they start playing this film, which was their orientation film. It's very, like, cosmic and um, space opera-like, and it's just very, very dramatic. And it's just really creepy and strange. And the guy in the film, Larry Anderson, is no longer in Scientology, so they no longer show this film because of that reason, because he departed Scientology. He was a member for 30 years, and then he's seeking a refund. So now they no longer show the um, orientation film anymore. If you leave this room after seeing this film and walk out and never mention Scientology again, you are perfectly free to do so. It would be stupid, but you can do it. You can also dive off a bridge or blow your brains out. That is your choice. But if you don't walk out that way, if you continue with Scientology, we will be very happy with you. And you will be very happy with you. You will have proven that you are a friend of yours. People always wonder, what's the fascination with celebrities inside Scientology? Why do they have their own celebrity center? And how do celebrities benefit Scientology? So here are a few things L. Ron Hubbard said about celebrities. So first, how does LRH define a celebrity? So a celebrity is also further defined as any person important in his field or an opinion leader or his entourage, business associates, family or friends with particular attention to the arts, sports, and management and government. LRH from HCO policy letter May 23rd, 1967 on celebrities. So why celebrities? So LRH says, a being expands wanted conditions to the degree he is trained and uses Scientology technology. Celebrity Center will ensure that beings in power use their power to create a safe space, thus bringing about destimulation and will bring people into aesthetics and speed the forward drive of creating a new civilization. From HCO Policy Letter, February 22, 1970, Celebrity Center. So why artists? LRH says, we instinctively revere the great artist, painter, or musician, and society as a whole looks upon them as not quite ordinary beings. And they're not. They are a cut above man. What distinguishes civilized man as man is that he is mirrored in a problems, which just get worse the more he solves them. The being who can recognize the actual source of problems and so see them vanish is too rare to be easily comprehended. When a being can do this, make problems vanish with a glance, he is certainly no longer man. And the problems artists have are legend. LRH from the State of Existence, 1965. 
LRH knew that celebrities would put legitimacy onto Scientology. If you have these famous faces attached to the church, yes, there's the aspect where they have money to donate to the church, but it's not even necessarily about that. It's more about having that one person that you may look up to actually be a Scientologist, and then you attribute your, their success to Scientology. So you'll see someone like Tom Cruise, and you may look up to him as an actor, and you say, well, he's in Scientology, it must be good. There must be some workable things inside Scientology. So you have these people who are opinion leaders in their field, maybe they're in the government and the police force, and they're talking about how Scientology has helped them. So you think, wow, well, you know, let me give this Scientology thing a shot. So a lot of people come in and they stay in Scientology like I did because of these celebrities. And I stayed in because I was saying, well, look, there are these different celebrities and famous faces who seem like they're doing quite well in life and they're attributing it to Scientology. Maybe I'm not seeing what they're seeing, so let me give it a little bit more of a shot. Let me see what these famous people see in Scientology. And that's how they trap you. And that's how they get people to stay in Scientology. They say that Tom Cruise has helped introduce Scientology to over a billion people on this planet. A Scientologist can be defined by a single question. Would you want others to achieve the knowledge you now have? In answering that question, Tom Cruise has introduced LOH technology to over one billion people of Earth. And that's only the first wave he's unleashed, which is why the story of Tom Cruise, Scientologist, has only just begun. So all across the planet, people, you know, see Tom Cruise as this huge movie star and they say, well, you know, Tom Cruise is a Scientologist. Let me find out what Scientology is. And that's the danger of having celebrities attached to Scientology because you go into Scientology and then you learn about the abuses and the money extortion and all of these other horrible things. So you're a new actor and you come to Hollywood. And most actors, when they're first getting started, they'll do background work on TV and film. And the way that you do that is by going to central casting. And they're like the main casting office that um, casts extras on a TV and film. Now there's like two days that you can go a week that central opens up for actors to line up outside and to register for background work and get into their files. So Scientology knows most actors coming off of the Greyhound bus or just flying into town are going to land at Central Casting. So they have a couple of their um, Division 6 people, which Division 6 is like the new people department of Scientology. And um, they come and they start talking to the different people in line. And they'll try to get them to go to one of those workshops like I did, one of those breaking into the industry, how to get started, how to get an agent, how to get into the Screen Actors Guild. So the different weeks, they have a different topic. They'll talk to these um, wannabe actors and they'll tell them, you know, um, you don't want to, you know, be an extra. I mean, it's fine if you want to make a couple bucks and try it out once or twice, but I know the real reason why you're here is to try to be an actor and we can show you how to do that. You don't have to just be in the background, you can be the star. And we can give you the tools so you can become that star. We have a workshop tomorrow night at 7.30, can we sign you up and we'll expect you there? So that's kind of the way that they um, try to recruit um, new people totally fresh, because that's their prime candidate, the wannabe actor, the wannabe model, the wannabe musician. They want, they want to catch them, and um, at their most vulnerable points where they're just willing to do anything, they might not have the support of their family or friends, they know all of this. So the new actor is like a real prime candidate for Scientology. Now, of course, like I said, backstage newspaper. They buy the biggest, glossiest ads in backstage newspaper because where do actors go when they get off of that Greyhound bus and they go to the Samuel French bookstore, which is, you know, books where they sell different, like, acting books on, you know, the craft. They're going to pick up a copy of backstage newspaper. Scientology knows that. They have all the ads, and you're going to see one of their industry seminars. They may advertise about one of their books. Backstage actually throws a convention for actors called Actor Fest. 
and it's held in LA, New York, Chicago, just the different like major acting markets. And they have it in, you know, like usually late fall or the winter in LA. And, you know, thousands of actors come and they have just different like actor related vendors and businesses, headshot photographers, casting directors have like workshops and different things there that you can sign up for. So it's a, you know, it's a big event in the year for actors to come and they network with different people, so on and so forth. So, um, you know, businesses normally just have like the standard booth, but Scientology has almost like the whole entire back wall of the place. And, um, you know, they just have all of their pretty smiling, you know, Sea Org workers, which are their staff members of the Celebrity Center. And, um, you know, they start talking about Scientology and talk about their workshops, talk about their classes. And they basically, you know, get people to sign up to come into the Celebrity Center for whatever they're, you know, selling at the time. And, um, it's big for them because they don't have to convince people at first to come into the Celebrity Center. These actors are just walking around and they can approach them, bring them back to the booth and, you know, um, do the first introduction right then and there. So ActorFest is a very big um, recruitment for Scientology and they have different, you know, acting related um, companies that are owned by Scientologists that are also there. And, you know, those different acting schools that are run by Scientologists eventually start talking to, you know, you as a new actor in their class and they'll start saying stuff like, wow, you know, um, you just have a little bit of stage fright. You know, you know, I'm a Scientologist and, you know, there's this great place called the Celebrity Center and we can actually help you with that. So, you know, whether you get into Scientology directly through, you know, the actual Scientologist or you get in through one of their other um, acting related Scientology front groups, I mean, you're bound to be introduced to Scientology one way or the other as an actor, as a musician, as someone trying to break into the entertainment industry. So that's why it's really important to see and know what this group is up to. So you don't even have the curiosity like I did to go in there and then end up giving them basically, you know, all your money and all your time and you just realize it's just a money-making organization. Another way that actors get roped in are through acting auditions. And there are two main sites that actors submit themselves on every day for acting work, and that's Actors Access and LA Casting. So about once or twice a month on each one of those sites, you're gonna see a posting for maybe a Scientology video. Come in and audition at the Celebrity Center, and they'll have like a number of different roles for each project that cover just like a whole variety of different types of different people. So there's usually the direct way through the Scientology video, but sometimes they'll mask it a little bit and they'll say, um, come into audition for the Way to Happiness PSA. Now the Way to Happiness is a Scientology book, but people may not know that and they'll submit for it and they're really gonna be in a Scientology film. They'll go to the Celebrity Center to audition for the film and then afterwards, like I've seen like different staff members come up to different actors who are coming out of an acting audition and say, well, since you're here, I mean, if you're curious to find out what Scientology really is, let's let's watch this video display or here, read this pamphlet about what Scientology is. There's so many actors like yourself who are in Scientology right now. And, you know, we can help you with a number of problems. Here, look at these different courses we're offering. Boom, they put you in the Regis office and they get you signed up for your first course. Milton Katselis was a famous acting teacher and he taught an exclusive master class at the Beverly Hills Playhouse. And some of his students are like Alec Baldwin, George Clooney, Michelle Pfeiffer. So he taught a lot of really huge names in Hollywood. He was the go-to acting teacher. Now Milton was a longtime Scientologist since the 1960s. And he was an OT5 and he used his classes as a, like a recruitment ground for Scientology. So say you're an actor in class and maybe you're hitting like a roadblock or you know, you're not feeling like you can really access your emotions and you're just not really doing well. Well, Milton will use that opportunity to say, look, you know, I have this church that I go to and we have courses that can help unleash that creativity inside of you. So you're an actor and you're going to class and then you end up going into Scientology. You may not get in through Milton directly introducing it to you, but you're using these Scientology principles in your work. He's using Scientology philosophy and different ideas to help you in your acting work. So you're basically in a Scientology acting class. 
So this was like the main recruitment ground for many of the top actors that you see in Scientology. Milton introduced Scientology to them. Now Milton died a couple years ago and his classes are no longer running. So this isn't now a recruitment tool for Scientology in 2013, but this was like the main way they recruited actors back in the day. People don't really know what Scientology or Dianetics actually is, so here are some videos from the church that explain some of their basic principles. Stress, anxiety, depression, negative thinking, irrational behavior, unwanted aches and pains. Where do these things come from? In the next 40 minutes, you will discover the single source of all these problems. It's called the reactive mind. And it's the part of your mind that stores all your painful experiences and then uses them to control you without you knowing it. Your reactive mind is the cause of what's wrong in your life. But with Dianetics, you're going to learn how to get rid of it. So to recap, Scientology believes you have your analytical mind, which is that part of your mind that just kind of computes and stores data. But there's also that reactive mind. And the reactive mind is what you're trying to get rid of in Scientology. It's the place of your mind that stores your fears, your pains, your upsets. And they tell you, well, if you don't have this part of your mind, you're going to be a much more capable person. So in Scientology, the way to get rid of this reactive mind is through a process called auditing. Auditing is the process of asking specifically worded questions designed to help you find and handle areas of distress. This is done with an auditor, meaning one who listens. An auditor does not offer solutions or advice. They are trained to listen and to help you locate those experiences that need to be addressed. But some experiences are so deeply buried within the mind, they are not easily recalled. The auditor helps you pinpoint these with the aid of an e-meter. When you think of something that has upset or stress connected to it, this shows up on the meter. Your attention can now be directed to that thought. Through auditing, one is able to look at their own existence and discover the past experiences that are holding them back against their will. How ironic that the Scientologists who are so obsessed with psychiatrists most of them could use a psychiatrist themselves, but the fact that they, that they hate psychiatrists, but basically what they're doing with auditing is a really expensive form of psychotherapy. It just, by someone who's not trained and has no knowledge or willing to um, study brain chemistry. Auditing is purchased by the intensive, and an intensive is 12 and a half hours of auditing. And at the Celebrity Center, when I left, it was $3,200 per intensive. Now, to go clear, you probably need 40 to 50 intensives of auditing. So it's not cheap, and that's only the first half of the bridge to total freedom of what L. Ron Hubbard's path to enlightenment is. There's another big belief in Scientology, and that's that you're an immortal spirit. And your spirit is called your Thetan. It's you. You are a being an intelligence, a consciousness, that part of you that is aware of being aware. In Scientology, we use the word Thetan. The term Thetan is taken from the Greek letter Theta, which has long served as a symbol for thought or spirit. We use Thetan to avoid confusions with other concepts and beliefs regarding the soul or spirit. It isn't something you have. You wouldn't say, my Thetan. You'd simply say, me. You have a body, you have a mind, you are a Thetan. Most of the ideas in Scientology in the beginning are just basic universal truths of the world and that's kind of how they wrote people in and then if you can believe some of the beginning stuff you start believing some of the later stuff in Scientology and as you go up the ranks in Scientology the more controlled your life gets the more money you invested the more time you have to commit and your whole life becomes engulfed in Scientology L. Ron Hubbard came up with the path towards enlightenment called the bridge to total freedom and the bridge to total freedom was a path laid out where you can attain spiritual freedom now there are two sides to the bridge to total freedom there's the left side which is training to become an auditor and the right side is the processing section of the bridge. And that's where you go up and you attain the spiritual wins and gains through auditing. 
Now, to go up this bridge to total freedom, it could take anywhere from maybe five years to 25 plus years. And to go both sides of the bridge is probably going to cost you close to a million dollars. This bridge to total freedom has been modified several times by David Miscavige. What he would do is redo the level and say that he found like lost technology, so basically lost information from L. Ron Hubbard. And he would say, well, the reason you didn't attain the goal of this level is because, you know, there was people who were suppressive in Scientology who made sure the level wasn't workable. And now I found the lost information that's going to help make the level workable. So the people who are at the top of the bridge now have to go back down to the bottom of the bridge and they have to get all their certificates canceled and they have to restart from the bottom and that's how they start bilking you for more money even when you get up to the top you think you're done nope you have to go back to the bottom and redo those courses most people when they get started in Scientology will start off on one of their life improvement courses now these life improvement courses are a series of courses that usually take about two weeks to do and they address various areas in your life the first thing probably most everyone does is a course that's actually the theology of Scientology. That's where you're learning about the actual philosophy itself. And it is a religious philosophy, but it's also an applied religious philosophy, so you go apply it. Kind of like a spiritual college. They have tons of courses on yeah, everything. pretty much any subject yeah. you can really think of. There are courses on how to communicate better, how to get along with others, how to handle negative people, how to raise children. It's not just a philosophy where you sit and think about it. It's taking the spiritual nature of man and it's combining it with something that's really practical. It has a way of being very, very simple and easy to come across to the reader and easy to apply, but also extremely powerful. You come in, you pick a chair you like, you sit down, you study there. It's really quite simple. You feel good when you're studying there. You don't need to be a Scientologist and you can be any religion really to come check it out. The whole point is you're yourself. In a church of Scientology, you're the one doing the learning. Nobody's preaching to you or teaching it to you. You're learning it yourself. And basically when they're selling you this course, they're um, trying to find your ruin. And especially for actors going into the celebrity center, they're trying to figure out what's holding you back from being successful as an actor, as a musician, as a model, whatever you are. So you may have issues with, say, your self-confidence, or maybe you have stage fright, or whatever it is. There's a course for that. So once they figure out what's really holding you back and why you're not being successful as an actor, you take a chance on the course and you say, well, it's only 50 bucks to sign up, and maybe I'm going to gain a little bit more confidence at the end of the course. But it's their way of getting you indoctrinated into Scientology to where you start donating for more of the larger courses. So this is really like the first introduction is through these basic courses. The first major step you do in Scientology is the purification rundown. The purification rundown actually opens the way to spiritual progress. It's an all-natural regimen which frees one from the harmful effects of drugs and toxins. Old drugs that you took, pesticides, you sweat all those things out of your system and you feel so much more alive. It's revitalizing. The simplicity and the power of it is immeasurable. Scientology is like very anti-medicine. They're also anti-psychiatry. So for example, if you wanted to take a Tylenol for a headache, that's not recommended. You're not going to take a Tylenol because basically taking a Tylenol is going to suppress the headache. It's not actually handling the root of the headache. So Scientology believes that most of these are psychosomatic illnesses that are just kind of caused by the mind. And they also believe these drugs and toxins store in the fatty tissues of your body. So by doing this program, you're able to, you know, cleanse your body and be able to have spiritual gains because they say these drugs and chemicals are holding you back. So that's why people may have a second thought when taking drugs or by, you know, taking an over-the-counter medicine because it may impede their spiritual progress in Scientology. You have to um, come into the Celebrity Center every single day and on their basement floor is their purification delivery center. They have two or I guess three women in charge of the purification program. Now they're not medical professionals, they're just staff members who are trained under L. Ron Hubbard in his principles on this type of drug detox. So you take basically um, a whole mega dose of vitamins, all different types of vitamins, and you also take niacin. Now at the end of the program you're taking upwards of 5,000 milligrams of niacin, so you're taking like a really toxic dose of niacin. You drink a calcium magnesium drink, and then you go and you exercise for 30 minutes. And it's supposed to, you know, um, get all the nice and everything running in your system, get your blood flowing. You change into your bathing suit and you go into the sauna. Now you go into the sauna 
for four and a half hours a day. This isn't just, you know, a quick, you know, easy, you know, spa-like sauna that you're going in. You're really going in there trying to get rid of these drugs and toxins out of your body. One thing I remember that you had terrible allergies and and you would your nose would run constantly and there was throat clearing all night which would keep me up at night and and there were mounds and mounds. it reminded me of my maternal grandmother who always slept with a box of tissues and and this pile of tissues would grow uh, throughout the night with the multiplying of the of the clear mucus from your nose and mucous membranes from allergies. And I said, well, why, take a Benadryl for God's sakes. Oh no, I can't take a Benadryl. It's a drug and it's, it's terrible and I can't take a Benadryl. And the amount of suffering that you were going through when all you had to do was take a, a Benadryl and it wasn't as if I'm pushing crack on you or crystal meth, I'm, I'm pushing an over-the-counter medicine that's one of the safest things used in hospitals on a daily basis for a variety of reasons. And finally, you gave in and took a Benadryl. And then it was another three or four months before I convinced you to go to the doctor to get some Nasonex or Flonase. That so if you live in LA, chances are you have allergies, chances are you take Flonase uh, year round and you didn't want to take that. Somehow it was going to alter your being and really all it does is alter your histamines. So on Tuesday nights at the Celebrity Center, they'll have a free lecture about the purification rundown. And sometimes they'll even have one of their celebrities host the lecture. So as an actor in the audience, you're hearing a celebrity that you've seen on TV, in film, basically vouch for this program and say how this program has helped them succeed in the industry because now they don't have these drugs and toxins and chemicals holding them back by re-stimulating in their system and maybe impeding their um, work as an actor because they say it's going to um, hold back your creativity if these drugs are in your system. even if you haven't taken drugs, even if you're just in this world that we live in. There's pollution, there's chemicals, there's other things out there. So they're saying, well, all those things are going to hold back your artistic creativity. So you're thinking, okay, you have this celebrity saying how they got successful by doing this program, and I'm a health, you know, conscious person, so maybe this program is something I should invest in. Now, the program's about $2,000, and, you know, as a young actor who's not, you know, a working actor at this point, you're saying, well, you know, maybe this is, I can look at this as an investment into my career. Maybe this is what's going to launch my career. When you do the purification program, you're on the program with a partner, which is called your twin. And your twin's supposed to be looking out for you. But also when you're on the purification program, you're sitting in the sauna with maybe 10 or 20 other people. Now at the Celebrity Center, you may be in the sauna with editors, writers, directors, producers, all sorts of types of industry people. So it's almost like you know, you can network in the sauna. So while I was on the sauna my second time, I was in the sauna with someone who was on the show True Blood. So one of the other girls was getting all excited because one of the actors from True Blood was in our sauna. You as an actor look and you see someone like that in the sauna and you think, well, wow, they're successful and they're already, you know, a working actor and they're doing this program, so it must be good because they wouldn't waste their time with it. And I've met just a various number of other actors who were, you know, working actors and who were on this program. And, you know, you're going through the experience with them. So you really bond with these people and you really connect with them. And you really feel like you're on a mission. Like when I was on the Purif, I felt like I was really going to become spiritually free. And I was on this journey and I was going to help for the aims of Scientology. And you have other people who are all encouraging that. There's other people there to support you. And even though you're going through these horrible, sometimes experiences in the sauna like I was, you have other people there that you went through it with. So even though necessarily it might not have been the greatest experience, you still try to give it hope and continue on because there's other nice people there. And there's other people who, you know, understand what you're going through. And they're encouraging you and saying, oh, just give it a little bit more of a shot. So on my first Purify, I was on it with a woman named Ivana Lewis. And Ivana was the mother to the actor Johnny Lewis, who was on the show Sons of Anarchy. 
So I was friendly with Devana and we would talk in the sauna about her son and how different Scientology courses helped him to accelerate his career, access a range of emotions, and how I should maybe sign up for some of these different courses. And she's like, look, I will do anything to make someone famous with my connections. So then therefore they can go and disseminate Scientology on a grand scale. So she gave me a referral to a talent manager. Now the crazy thing is her son ended up killing an older woman. He jumped off a roof and he killed himself. It's a 28 year old actor from the TV show Sons of Anarchy brutally killed his elderly landlady Wednesday. Then as he tried to run away, he fell possibly from the roof to his death. He was obviously troubled and he had mental illness. And in Scientology, you're not seeking help for your mental illness outside of the church. You're going to receive more Scientology services. So that's the problem. They control you to such a level where you feel like, you know, you can't seek outside help. You have to just try to make it work with Scientology. And it's really sad that, you know, her own son had to, you know, tragically die like that and kill someone. It's crazy. When I was on the Pure, if I was told that Whitney Houston was supposed to be coming in to receive auditing. Now, sadly, she passed on before she was actually able to receive any services from Scientology. But basically, I was told that they had a comm line, which is a communication line to Whitney Houston, and they were really working on her. They were trying to handle her objections to Scientology and show her that Scientology was going to be a solution to her problems. We all know that Whitney Houston had you know, struggles with drugs and alcohol, and she had other personal issues going on in her life. And Scientology was offering her a helping hand and telling her, look, if you come into the Celebrity Center, we are a safe haven for artists, and we can help deliver what's called auditing, and we can help you with these problems. Now, she passed on, and she wasn't able to go into Scientology, but they were really working on trying to get her to come into the Celebrity Center but it never actually ended up happening. So me and one of my other friends on the purification program decided that we were gonna recruit Bobby Christina Brown, who was Whitney Houston's daughter, into Scientology. Now there are all these media reports out there that Bobby Christina was abusing drugs, and we thought, wow, this program is gonna be amazing for her, but we're also gonna be able to get Scientology out there on a grand scale. So maybe we can work with um, that other Scientologist who had a comm line to Whitney Houston to maybe try to recruit Bobby Christina into the church. We're gonna work on this. We're gonna try to get some of these other younger celebrities into Scientology. And we have these other members who are saying, look, Steve, Amanda, you guys are young. You guys are perfect to get the younger generation, the young Hollywood crowd into Scientology. You guys should work together as a team to recruit young Hollywood into Scientology. So I was also starting to begin to get onto that force of recruiting celebrities into Scientology for the idea that it was gonna help bring our message out there into the world on a grand scale. Because I admitted to having alcohol and I drug reverted, I was programmed to go back onto the purification rundown for a second time. Now before I could actually walk onto the program and start going through the sauna rituals and all of that business, I had to get a PTS interview, which stands for Potential Trouble Source Oppressive Persons Interview, and I had to receive a security check. Now I'll talk a little bit later on the video what a potential trouble source and what a suppressive person actually is. So they're asking me, you know, like what evil intentions do you have against Scientology? Um, who do you know that's antagonistic to Scientology? Um, do you have any government security clearance? Has any of your family or friends gone to the press about Scientology? Um, and they start asking you all these really like out there like super crazy questions. L. Ron Hubbard was paranoid. And you as a member of Scientology have to undergo these constant checks on the e-meter to see if you're still a loyal, devoted member. I'm on the meter getting these security checks every couple weeks, even to a point at the end, I'm on the meter like almost every single time that I'm going in there. And they're just really hammering you, trying to figure out like what crimes you may have committed. What have you done that um, is evil towards Scientology. So I'm on the meter and they're checking me for a few hours and they're trying to see like who may be suppressing me in my environment. They're asking me all these crazy questions. So eventually I pass the meter and I'm able to go on to the program. If you think about what type of health problems can be caused by sitting in the sauna for, you know, four and a half hours a day, you know, that heat really takes a toll on you. So, I mean, I have my own personal horror story, but the first one before mine was this woman, and she was basically lying in the sauna, unconscious. She wasn't responding to anyone. She was just lying there 
in what seemed like pain and agony, and she was totally out. So afterwards we find out she was kind of laughing about it, but she was saying, you know, she was running out anesthesia out of her body. So that anesthesia re-stimulated and now she was in the anesthesia experience and she was completely passed out and she was experiencing the effects again. Okay, depending on what you believe, if you believe in the Scientology idea that you're running out drugs, that's one thing. But if you're looking at it from a medical standpoint of what this program requires and the vitamins and the heat and the running, not everyone's cut out for this program. And, you know, you don't see a real doctor. I mean, you do, but you see a Scientology doctor so who signs off on the program beforehand. You can't go to your own doctor because they may advise you not to do the program because of how taxing it is on your body. So, um, yeah, there's not any medical professionals on site at this point. It's just you just do whatever um, L. Ron Hubbard prescribes in this sort of case. And there's the book, and it tells you what to do. So in my experience and what happened to me was I start feeling kind of strange and it's about like at like hour three in the sauna. So all of a sudden um, I have my cup of water and I throw it up in the air and I'm saying it's raining, it's raining in the sauna. But obviously it's not raining in the sauna. And I knew that but I kind of didn't. I just was starting to act weird and I'm not that type of person to try to make a show but I start talking and very um, overly you know, um, expressing myself, which isn't really like me. So then I try to get out of the sauna and I start stumbling and I can't walk, like I can't use my legs. And I start slurring and I, I just kind of like go and collapse into one of the chairs. So one of the other um, public Scientologists who's on the program goes up to get the purification in charge. So the woman comes downstairs and she looks at me and she just goes, um, Stevie, you know, it looks like you're having so much fun. And in her mind, she thinks that I'm running out the drug and I'm having fun because I'm running alcohol out of my system. So I'm actually having fun. But really, I'm like basically like almost like scared for my life at this point because I'm not sure what's going on with me. I'm, I'm dehydrated. I probably had some sort of like a heat stroke thing going on. It was, I, I couldn't even walk. I can't talk. I'm just totally just lying there and I'm, I'm not responding to them. And it's scary when you're inside your body and you're like, why aren't you talking? So I get one of the other girls to take me into the shower, put cold water on me, and she escorted me back into the sauna while I'm still in this state of delusion and craziness. And I was instructed to go back into the sauna instead of resting. Because by being in the sauna, they say that I'm going to sweat out more of the drug and therefore my body will be clean of it and I'll feel sparkly better at the end. Well, really, I was just getting more dehydrated, more delusional. I was, I just felt like I was being tortured by being in that sauna. I'm just like, get me out of here. I was in the sauna that day about six hours or six and a half hours, maybe. And... I mean, at the end, you know, I was still a little bit kind of out of it, but I said, well, I have to tell them I feel better so I can go home because they were just prescribing to go back into the sauna. A registrar, best way to describe it is, is basically a salesman. It's a sales function, okay? People come into the organization and they need to get service. Service costs money. The registrar works with them to basically, if you cut through all the stuff, he works out how they get it paid for. And their performance is measured by statistics. The registrar's statistic is the amount of money brought in. It's not necessarily how many people were helped, it's how much money got brought in. And their week goes from Thursday at two to the next Thursday at two. So that's their week that they record statistics on. So um, you can imagine the amount of pressure it is for them to get money in by Thursday at two because there's repercussions for them and different condition formulas that they're going to have to do if their statistics are not. So they're basically punished if they're not getting money in. So Tuesday, Wednesday, especially Thursday morning, they're doing anything it takes to get you to donate for your next service and to donate as much as you can. And they all compete on how much money they can bring in. So it's really unethical how Scientology regs you for money. There's just a numerous amount of stories out there, including mine, that really showcases that Scientology is a money-making organization. One of the new persons registered in Scientology was an actor himself before he joined the Sea Organization. Now they intentionally make him your registrar when you first get into Scientology because he's really friendly and he's really good with the new people. 
he's one of the top producing registrars, of course, because he gets all the new actors in and he tells them how Scientology has helped him in his acting career and his music career and how they can gain similar successes. So he basically gets you to donate more money than you were initially intending to spend that day because he uses the Scientology as the way to acting stardom and he gives all the wrecked to riches stories how Scientology has helped someone like you who came into Scientology who maybe not really had anything but has now had their career boomed by taking these different Scientology courses. So then again you know you're going in Scientology and you're going in on a new day thinking you know let's see if they're going to be able to help me today and you go in and what happens you donate more money because they use these different lines on a very vulnerable young actor saying look this is the way take this course it's X amount of dollars but you need this course let's max out your credit card and we're going to be able to help you so one time I was waiting for one of my receipts to print out and um, I was sitting at one of the desks, I was just looking at my phone or whatever, and there's a few other registrars that were standing by that desk. So then um, I overheard one of the regs, and she basically just said, I don't even care what they say to me, talking about the public Scientologist. I will say and do whatever it takes to get them to give me their credit card number. Just point blank. Now at this time, I was like starting to become like more of a believer. So I kind of ignored it. I kind of just said, well, they're just doing it for, you know, the greatest good. Like I started reasoning how a Scientologist would reason overhearing that statement, not thinking, well, maybe this is a red, red flag over here that maybe something's not right. At the end of the course period, when you're about to leave, whether it's for lunch or whether it's a dinner break or whether you're about to go home, you have to go out one door. Now the regs line up all along that door. So you're going to have your IAS reg, you're going to have the ones trying to get money for courses, the bookstore officer, anyone whose job it is to collect money from you, they're lined up by those doors. So when you leave, you know one of them is about to grab you and pull you into one of their offices and reg you for money. So some Scientologists start trying to find back doors that they can leave through so they don't have to face the regs. But the regs know that, so they may start waiting for you in different areas. So they kind of spread themselves out. Now, to think you're in a church and you have to think about an escape route so you don't have to pay them any money. I mean, there's just a number of times I was going out that back door just cringing because I knew that they were gonna ask me to maybe donate for something that I didn't finish paying for or they were gonna try to get me to up my status level for something. So, I mean, just the idea that these regs have to and come after you right at, right after a course to get your money. You can't even finish your Scientology course you're on. They want more money from you. They take you off a course. It's ridiculous. So I get to my car one night and it's about 10 o'clock and it's after course. And I hear a tap on my window and it was one of the regs. So I roll my window down and he basically said, look, if you're not ready to donate the $3,200 for your basic book and lectures, you could at least buy the books themselves instead of buying the whole entire set. And just the books itself was about five or $600. You can just buy the books. You have to do it right now. I'm like, look, I'm on my way out. I just told you I can't afford it. He said, look, you need to be an example of LRH tech, basically the technology in the books. And you need to basically be a good Scientologist and demonstrate the usage of it. And you're gonna get more people into Scientology. You're being able to help us because we're using this money to disseminate to other Scientologists, you know, around the world are using this money to help other people. And we're also trying to, you know, clear this planet. And it's a big job and we need money to do that. I basically was able to drive away after a half hour of him standing at my window. I can't even leave. I have them asking me for money the second I step onto the property, the second I leave the property. So I get home one night and I get a call. And I got home kind of late because they were regging me for hours and hours. So I get a um, call from their bookstore officer. It's about like 2 a.m. at this point. So I'm thinking, why is the bookstore officer calling me at like 2 in the morning? So I answer the phone. I need you to buy those lecture tapes that um, we talked about. I said, look, I can maybe come in tomorrow. I'm going to be here. Maybe I'll look into purchasing them if you know I can somehow make it go right with my finances. And he's like, look, I need the money right now. I'm like, well, why can't I just come in the morning and pay for it? What's the big rush? He's like, look, I can't even go to sleep until I get 
my quota met. And my quota is whatever his quota was. And I just need X amount of dollars, which is the cost of those lectures, so I can be able to stop calling people in the middle of the night to get them to buy something from me. Now, just the desperation from him that I needed to buy these lectures and he couldn't even go to sleep. It just, just like something wasn't right. And I just felt so bad for these, these you know, Sea Org members who basically live and work there 24 seven and think that he's going to bed at 2 a.m. and he has to wake up at 5 or 6 a.m. and have a whole new quota. It's, they are so money motivated. He can't go to sleep until he sells more books. I was at the event where they released the L. Ron Hubbard Encyclopedias. And after the event, the doors opened and there are all the staff members with forms trying to get you to buy several sets of the encyclopedias. Now, I wasn't going to buy the encyclopedias because they were $750 and I didn't have the money at the time. And again, I just didn't feel that they were necessary because I already was spending thousands of dollars on books and other things that I wasn't even using at the time. So. Me and this other girl who I was friends with, who is a Scientologist, were having to fight through all of the different um, staff members because they just kept approaching us while we were walking, saying, how many sets are you gonna buy? And um, do you wanna donate a set to the library or whatever? They were just trying to get you to buy as many sets as possible. Because of course they were um, working on their stats and they had to sell so many books and they were working on quotas. So um, it was at the very end of the event and we finally make it to the parking lot. And um, one of the staff members was waiting at the parking lot to try to get like any of the people who kind of straggled off into their, you know, to find the parking lot on their own. He was the one who was trying to, to sell to them. So um, he approaches my friend and starts trying to sell her the encyclopedias. So she begins to run up the stairs in the parking garage saying, no, 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 I'm not gonna buy any, no, not now. And she's running up the stairs away from the, um, the sales guy. So now if you think about it, we're in a religious spiritual group and you have to run away from someone who's trying to sell you books. It's just ridiculous. You can't just say, no, I can't make a donation at this time. I can't purchase the books. You are required to buy a set. This is what your duty is as a Scientologist, is to buy all the releases and to always be donating towards your next step on the bridge. So um, I never actually purchased the encyclopedia books, but I was getting phone calls from every single org almost all over the country trying to sell me these encyclopedias, and they don't take no for an answer. Scientology leader David Miscavige had called his flock to Clearwater's Ruth Eckerd Hall on June 30, 2007, for a major announcement. Over the next three hours, he explained that a team of church specialists had located and restored all of Scientology founder L. Ron Hubbard's recorded lectures from decades ago, including recordings that had never been available to church members. Listening to Hubbard's lectures, the team also determined Hubbard's texts were incomplete and out of order in places. Those volumes also were re-edited. Now, Miscavige said, the church had all of Hubbard's scriptures in complete form for the first time. The new collection of 18 books and 280 lectures on CDs was called The Basic. Miscavige called it the golden age of knowledge for Scientology. It also became a golden age of revenue for the church. The basics would cost parishioners $3,000 a set. Church staffers sold them aggressively in an effort to disseminate Hubbard's scriptures worldwide. Yes, that too, all of it, you can have it all. Ladies and gentlemen, I present you the basics. So I was in one of the Reg's offices and he was trying to sell me the basic book and lectures, which are basically just all of L. Ron Hubbard's scripture. And the whole set of the basics were $3,200. So um, obviously I'm still in the same financial state I was in. I'm a new actor. I'm trying to get my career going. I don't have just a spare $3,200 to be buying just sets of Scientology books. I was still considering myself a really strong believer in Scientology. This was basically my life. But again, I can't afford basically to be a Scientologist at this point. So um, I'm in the office and he's really just trying to do whatever 
he can do to get me to buy these books. And he's like, look, we're going to figure out a way to get this money and to get you to buy a set today, right now, you're going to buy a set of the basics. So I knew that I didn't have any available credit or anything, so I didn't really know how he was going to go about um, getting me these books. So he went through the whole process of checking all of my credit cards and trying to call the banks for increases on all of my cards. Nothing worked. I didn't have any available credit. So now he's trying to think of like alternative solutions to um, how he can get the funding so I can buy these books. So um, my dad gets to come into town for business here and there. And um, the guy knew that my dad would probably be someone who would give me money because my dad's supportive of me and my acting career and whatever I do. So he's like, you know, your dad's coming into town this week. What if we set him up for dinner at the Renaissance, which is their four-star restaurant at the Celebrity Center? We'll set him up for a really nice dinner, almost like trying to like wine and dine him. And then we're going to go on a tour of the Celebrity Center. And we're going to show him all around and have him meet different staff members and have them really just say, you know, um, how Scientology is basically the greatest thing and how it's helped their acting career. Because we're going to try to sell him on the idea that these books are going to help your acting career. And I'm just thinking, you know, I'm not going to take my dad here because I knew that they would sit him down and they'd have all these regs on him and they would try to guilt him and lie to him and say that these books are somehow related to, you know, my education as an actor. So I said, you know what, you know, my dad's really busy when he comes into town. We're not going to be able to get him in here. His work schedule's too busy. I just lied and told him that because I knew that there was no way that I was going to go in there knowing that I was going to plan a trick my dad for the books. And then they said, okay, well, you can't get him to come in. Let's call him right now and we'll try to get his credit card number over the phone. You can say that you're trying to loan the money from him and we can, um, you know, use that for um, getting these basic books. Again, no, I'm not calling my dad. Okay, well, what about Jonathan? Now, Jonathan is my best friend who um, I grew up with. And he's actually been to the Celebrity Center before. Um, he had a very small introduction to Scientology via me because, you know, I'm trying to be a good Scientologist and disseminate to all the people I meet about how wonderful Scientology is because it was somewhat helping me at this point. And I did learn some new tools and stuff, but all the abuses and things I had to go through weren't worth the few wins that I had. So I said, look, Jonathan's broke. He works at Dunkin' Donuts. He's not going to have the money to loan to me $3,200. That's just not going to happen. So, you know, the guy's just like really just kind of like frustrated because I'm not willing to give in or even give it a try to call these different people that he's referring to. So he goes, um, let's get your grandmother on the phone. And I'm just like, this guy is just a slime ball. He wants me to call my grandmother and ask my grandmother to donate $3,200 to Scientology books for me when she's a Christian and she's not going to be, she, I'm not even going to ask her. I don't have the heart to try to trick my grandmother into giving me basic books in Scientology. It just wasn't going to happen. He's like, all old people have a little bit of money that they're sitting on. I'm like, look, she's on a fixed income. Even if she's sitting on money, which she's not, I'm still not going to ask my grandmother for $3,200. That's just not the type of relationship we have. I love my grandmother. I'm not going to ask her to give me money to go towards Scientology. So, um, you know, he's still like, kind of like wheeling and dealing here, trying to figure out what we can do. Um, so he's like, do you have any investments? No. Do you have any gold bullion? No. At the time, 19, maybe 20 years old, and the guy's asked me, do I have any gold bullion that I can basically sell so I can use it to buy Scientology books? And he's like, look, I really wish Scientology had the ability just to um, have these books just be open resources to you guys, but we need to charge you. It costs money to assemble these books. Now, Scientology has their own printing department, and they print off these books. They can probably do it cheaply. I mean, there's no way that 20 books in Scientology lectures cost them $3,200 or even even half of that to even print. It just doesn't make any sense. And even so, this is religious scripture that's supposed to be helping free mankind. Why would they be charging so much money for it? That's what was always the thing. If they want, if this tech can really, truly 
make a difference in people's lives and help people, wouldn't they do it for free and just go all around the world and go on tours and give people these books for free? No, you have to buy them. And you also, once you buy the set of basics, they're going to have you donate sets to libraries around the country, around the world. They want you to spend money to disseminate these books. It's just, it's crazy. It's really insane. Because it wasn't just like I was in one registrar, you know, sitting with him and trying to work on this cycle of getting me my books. There was tons of registrars calling me on my phone from all different orgs and even people who weren't registrars. There's other staff members in the org who were trying to sell these books. It was anyone, the director of processing, it was the auditor, it was the core supervisor, it was anyone who isn't, it's not part of their job to sell books, it's their job to maybe help people. And what are they doing? They're selling these books. And it just completely rubbed me the wrong way that they think that, you know, I was going to donate thousands of dollars for books. I revealed to one of the regs that I had $2,500 on account at FLAG. Now, I was planning to go to FLAG to do some FLAG-only rundowns and receive some auditing. And this guy at the time was trying to reg me to get my Congress lectures. And they were pretty much about the same price. Maybe it was three or $4,000 to get it. But that was still a bulk of the money to get these Congresses. So he told all the other regs I had money on account. So all these regs began to call me all over CC. These regs are just calling me, trying to be the one to get the sale. They want to raise their stats. They may want to commission off of these lecture sales. So I had one of these regs call me up. And she's like, look, you're not going to be able to go to FLAG unless you purchase these Congress lectures. These Congress lectures are a prerequisite before you're going to be able to be accepted to go to FLAG on services. So therefore, buy these Congresses now and then you can work on going to FLAG maybe in a few months. So I believed her. So then we extracted the money off of account at FLAG and we billed it towards these Congress lectures. And I was really excited to go to FLAG. I thought I was really going to get a lot of help by doing these FLAG auditing rundowns that you can only do there. But then they got me to buy these lectures that I wasn't even going to listen to. I heard he had a whole set of basic books that were just sitting and collecting dust at the time. So then at the time, I'm like, thank you for helping me. Because I thought she was helping me so I could be able to go to FLAG to do these other services. And she laughs. And... It made me feel like ripped off because she's laughing and I thought she would maybe be like, yeah, you know, I'm just trying to look out for you and make you move up the bridge in Scientology. No, she laughed. I felt like a sucker. I felt like I was just totally taken advantage of right then and there. It was ridiculous that they took the money off of my account to purchase these books and they did anything to get that money. In any other church, say the Catholic Church, for example, if you can't afford to purchase the Bible, they'll lend you one of their Bibles. Maybe you can't afford to go to one of their Bible study groups. Maybe they'll have like a work study program or they'll let you go in for free. In Scientology, that's not the case. You have to have money to be a Scientologist, regardless of what they want to tell you. You need money. So I'm just looking at it and thinking, well, this isn't a real religious organization. Because if they're trying to spread the good word and the message, and if Scientology can really help people, wouldn't they maybe let you borrow the books for free so you can study them and so you can maybe disseminate the good word and maybe be able to help others and be able to promote Scientology? You can't do that. You have to buy all these sets of books. You have to purchase these really expensive courses. And it's just not, to me, a religious organization. It's operating as a business, trying to sell you spirituality. So now the Reg is hitting me for $50,000 to go clear. And at this time, I'm still like 19, 20 years old. I don't really have $50,000 to donate to go clear. The Reg knows this. She's been with me, working with me for several years in Scientology. She knows all my credit cards, what the available credit lines, and how much balance I carry on them. She knew I wasn't going to be able to give her $50,000 today. She's like, Steve, this is your year. You are going to go clear this year. You have been in Scientology now for three, four years, and you haven't gone clear yet. This is the time. You are a Scientologist, and you need to go clear. It's your responsibility. So I'm thinking, okay, here we go. Now I'm going to be in another like five to six hour cycle with her trying to go back and forth with um, how I'm going to pay her $50,000, which I do not have. So all these regs come over and they're all surrounding the desk. So if all these regs over there with iPads, she's like, we're going to all start 
applying for credit cards for you. So basically, all the regs had iPads. They got my social security number. They got, you know, all my financial information. And all of them were running credit apps at the same time, with the theory being that hopefully it doesn't look like I'm hitting for a lot of credit once, because if you put all the credit apps through at once, maybe I'd be able to get approved for 10 credit cards all at the same time, instead of doing one at a time. So they all start applying for credit cards on my behalf. And I'm like, look, I don't really want to like affect my credit. I don't really want to be running 20 credit apps and then ruin my credit score. It's like it's only like three or four points each credit app anyways, and then you know it's gonna lift off in you know, a few months anyway. So I'm just like, okay, let's see what happens. So none of them get approved at the time because my credit wasn't as established as it is now. So then I'm like, look, as you see, I can't get approved for credit. I can't get you know, $50,000. I don't even have the ability to pay off $50,000. They're like, look, this is fine that you didn't get approved right off the bat. This is okay, this is just the first step. Now we have to handle the banks. Now we're gonna call each of these banks and we're gonna get you your credit line. I'm like, ha ha ha, like, you know, how am I actually gonna get approved for what they want from me, you know? So he's like, look, we have people higher up in American Express and other financial institutions who are Scientologists and they can underwrite and approve your credit card for the amount of credit that we need for you to be able to go clear. To think that there are people in the banks who are giving people credit lines that they are obviously not qualified for, is that like legal at all? It just doesn't seem right or even like ethical. And it's just, they. They were just gonna call up and get me approved. I just, I, I just said, look, you know what? We've tried. We can't get me the available credit. Let's just, you know, try to figure out another solution. And I just did anything I could just to get myself out of that room with them. I just try to still pretend like, okay, yeah, this is what I want. So they would actually let me go. Let me out of the room so then I can, you know, basically be free, you know, I, I'm, I'm locked up in the celebrity center day after day after day and it's just not like dawning on me yet that this is, you know, just like a money-making scheme. The International Association of Scientologists, or otherwise known as the IAS, is the membership department of Scientology and you donate to become a member. L. Ron Hubbard listed two different memberships that you could sign up for in the IAS. It wasn't called the IAS then, but it was the same basic principle. So in HCO policy letter, March 22, 1965, current promotion and org program summary membership rundown, he states there are two memberships, and he lists the international annual membership and gives it a cost at $30, and he lists a lifetime membership which is priced at $75. And in here he says there are no other memberships or statuses approved or known to LRH. An annual membership isn't going to run you $30 nowadays, and a lifetime membership isn't going to be $75. You're going to pay $5,000 for your lifetime membership, and that lifetime membership is required for you to go up the bridge. So if you want to make any progress in Scientology, you're going to have to be a lifetime member of the IAS. It's just, you're supposed to make a forced donation to be able to receive services in the church. It doesn't really make any sense. So I'm invited to a free dinner at the Renaissance restaurant after course, and they told me it was for a special briefing for some of their most dedicated Scientologists about the IAS. So um, I go down after course to the restaurant, and um, we have dinner, and everything seems really great, and a guy comes up, one of their IAS um, regs, basically, and he starts um, getting really enthusiastic and you know to like the point like he's like off the walls crazy he's like look we're gonna take down psychiatry and the IS is going to do that and we're gonna you know really you know make waves and we're really gonna get Dianetics and Scientology across all nations and um, he's like you know what we're gonna scream freedom and we are gonna you know just totally reverberate this whole building with screaming this freedom out loud and because we are going to get freedom from psychiatry and we are going to have freedom by going up the bridge and we are going to do this. So we're all screaming freedom, freedom and um, you know everyone's getting really excited and that's what they want to do. They want to get you really excited. So then they brought up a whiteboard, they wrote $10,000 on it, they circled the $10,000, they locked the door, there's people standing by the door 
And then the tone's different. He's like, we need $10,000 amongst you guys. You need to figure out how you're going to get us the $10,000. In order to eradicate psychiatry and in order to get our social betterment programs and our PSAs out there, we need money. So we're sitting there, they're like, okay, who's going to be the first donor? So then all the other IES regs are going around to all these different tables trying to get others to be the first person to stand up and donate money. So one of them goes, you know, Steve Mango's going to, you know, donate tonight. He's going to be the one. And um, I donated like $1,000 that night, which I didn't intend to donate that night. I was just going thinking I'm going to have a free dinner and hear about how Scientology is helping people. I didn't think again that a free dinner was going to somehow be a bait and switch and then get me to donate thousands of dollars that I didn't have at the time. So um, at the end, you know, I guess it wasn't enough how much I donated. So then they go up and they're like, look, you know, you need to donate a few more thousand dollars. You're a Scientologist. You have to do this. You are dedicated now. You're, you've been here for a few years now and, you know, this is the time that you actually start helping us. I'm like, look, I just donated a thousand dollars. I don't have the money to, you know, do any more than this. I already did enough. And then there's other people standing up with their reg and they're saying, you know, so and so just donated, you know, ten thousand dollars, for example. So and so just donated fifty thousand dollars. And people are clapping. So instead of donating ten thousand, they really donated, you know, twenty times that amount of money. But these other people just happen to have maybe better credit than I did, or they may happen to have more success than I did in their business or in their life. I mean, I'm still young at the time. I didn't really have the ability to donate tens of thousands of dollars to Scientology. And I'm like, even when I make a donation, it's just not enough. It just never was enough, which was, you know, just, I don't know. It was off-putting because I thought I was making a significant contribution to them, and they just wanted more. I was sitting in the HGC one day, which is the Hubbard Guidance Center, and I was waiting for like an interview or something. So I'm sitting there and the IES reg comes up to me. We have to reach this quota today. It's $50,000, for example. I don't really remember the exact amount, but it was around that amount. And um, we need you to donate towards that. And I'm like, and I'm laughing. She's like, I know, I know, because they know that I don't really have all that type of money to donate. She's like, look, you know, if we meet this quota, a Sea Org members are going to be able to go to a Cirque du Soleil show as a reward. So we're laughing because she knows I don't really have a lot of money, but she needs a lot of money so she can be able to go and reach her quota for the day, and so she can go to her Cir Cirque du Soleil show. So um, she's like, what's the max dollar amount that you can donate today? And I'm like, look, I don't really have anything to donate today because I've already been donating tens of thousands of dollars throughout the last couple of months. I don't have, you know, a significant amount that I can donate. So she's like, 50 bucks? I'm like, I can do 25. She's, and she didn't even want the $25. She's like, it's not even worth it. She's like, you know, it's not even worth filling out the form. You know what, let's meet again. And, you know, we can work on getting a sizable donation, which is going to have much more of an effect than just 25, 50 bucks. She ended up calling me one night and I ended up donating $5,000 towards my lifetime membership. So I donate the $5,000 and um, she's like, you know, we're gonna set up a photo shoot for you too because we're gonna do a photo shoot of you around CC and we're gonna put you on posters. And on the posters, we're gonna advertise donating towards your lifetime membership. So that was one of the ways she was trying to sell me to get me that $5,000 initially. You know, that's a cool thing. You're going to be around CC and everyone's going to know all about you. I do the photo shoot around Celebrity Center and I start appearing on posters around the org. And um, I'm just like, how did I give them $5,000? How did they talk that out of me? Because every time after they got a little bit of money out of me, even if at the time I was willing to maybe donate in that second, I go home that night, I'm like, how did I give them so much of my money? So I gave them my $5,000, but 
it was probably around that time, like a month or two after, that I actually left Scientology. So it was just happens to be right after I donate, I left Scientology. There was another really crazy IAS reg cycle that I was in, and she basically got me down to come down to her office. She's like, look, I need you to donate the total amount of your checking account to the IAS. This is pro-survival, and this is the best, most important way that you can utilize your money that you have in your checking account. She's like, I know it's scary. She said, just like that, I know it's scary. I know it's really hard to confront this, but you must do this because it's pro-survival, it's higher purpose, and we're gonna actually build a purification center in um, like, you know, New Orleans or something, and we're gonna get so many people through it. And, you know, your donation is gonna go towards that. Now I'm thinking, is she crazy? She really, is she, I was trying to figure out if she's really serious or not. She thinks I'm gonna spend my whole checking account to donate towards the IAS. So I'm looking at her and I'm trying to figure out, is she serious, is she not? And I'm just trying to feel her out, like, is, am I supposed to be laughing? But she's dead serious. She was serious, after all. So um, I'm like, look, Melissa, I'm just entertaining her at this point. I wasn't gonna give her all my money. I'm like, what about gas? I need to get home tonight. I don't have any gas in my tank. And I need to buy for groceries, for food. I was just trying to see, like, to what extent are they willing to go at to get my money? She's like, look. You're worrying about too much of the logistics. Take that out. Stop questioning and answering. Just do it. I'm telling you what's in your best interest, and it's to donate towards the IAS and to give us the money that we need. So I didn't give her, obviously, my whole check account. I probably gave her, you know, a few hundred bucks just to keep myself from, you know, trouble. You know, you can't just say no and not donate. You have to at least give a little bit of something. So I donated a little bit that night. But to think that they just want all my money in my whole bank account, where I'm saying I can't even feed myself if I give you all my money, and they're saying, well, this is for your best interest and for the best good of Scientology, and, you know, you're just thinking about yourself right now. You have to think about others. So that was really insane. And of course, through this whole time, I'm questioning Scientology and, th and thinking, is it really worth staying here? for what I'm hoping to get out of it, which are the gains and to be able to help my acting career and just my personal self and to get rid of this reactive mind, or do I leave? I, so, but, I, but still, I was still invested so deeply and I want it to work so badly. And recently, what made me want to speak out and to do this video is because I got an email about this guy and he donated $250,000 to the IAS and I knew him because I was on my Purif with him and I'm thinking how could such a nice guy you know be manipulated into donating all this money because I know that's how it is you're not giving this money in your free accord he doesn't walk into the org one day and say hey I want to donate $250,000 that I have lying around you're gonna say let's take the money out of your home let's get credit cards out who do you know you can borrow money from what about your business can we take money out of your business they'll do any way you know to drain the money of your account they'll do whatever it takes basically is what I'm trying to say to get the money out of you and people like that you know, they hit them and hit them and hit them and hit them until you're just weak enough and you donate. And they're saying, well, look, you know, you have to be a patron to go clear now and you need $50,000 for your patron, so how are we going to do it? And you need $50,000 to go clear anyway, so how can we get $100,000 right now? So that's basically why I decided to kind of speak out a little bit because I said, I want to stop people from actually having to... Um, be tricked into donating all this money when obviously donating this money isn't going towards the causes that they say it's going to. So it, it's just totally mind blowing the amount of money that they can extract from their parishioners. If you don't donate enough money, you can be security checked and they can try to find out like what your evil intentions are. Are you connected to someone who's antagonistic to Scientology? They can, you know, forbid you from going up the bridge any further in Scientology. So cut off your basically your spiritual freedom because you weren't willing to donate enough to the IAS. You know, there's just a number of different ways that they try to control you, so then you feel like you have to give this money. They may say, well, you can't, you know, be a Scientologist anymore. You can't talk to your friends and your family, and you can't go up the bridge because you're not willing to be like a true Scientologist and really, you know, be on the team because you're not willing to contribute enough money to be able to be like a, you know, true, dedicated, Scientologists and what they think is a true dedicated Scientology through a financial donation. It's not like how much 
time you're willing to spend on course, whatever, it's okay, how much money can we get? And if not, you know, you're going to have to suffer different consequences. And, you know, if someone thinks that they're not going to be able to speak to their family or friends or anymore, and they've been a Scientologist all their life, what else are they to do? They think this is the way to spiritual freedom. They think these courses are helping to, you know, clear the planet and to clear themselves. So they think, well, I need to, you know, take money out of my home because this is the way to spiritual enlightenment. My home is just a brick wall, but the gains you get in Scientology and through other people that I'm being able to help through my donation are more important than, say, having my home. My spiritual freedom and other people's spiritual freedom is more important, so I'm going to donate, say, a million dollars to the church because, you know, Scientology will be around for a lifetime. Maybe I'll help create that versus, oh, I have a home that I live in. Who cares about that? I'm a spiritual being. So that's how they trap you into, you know, donating all this money. Outside of the event, we were regging for the IES, which is separate from the Ideal Org building. That's what they were doing inside the event. Outside the event, we were talking to people as they came out to pay monies to the IES. And this woman just came to just sit down and just relax. And someone came up to her and said, um, we need you to make a donation to the IES. And um, she said, oh, gosh, whew. my husband and I just inside just made a $100,000 donation to the Ideal Org building. And this person was just like, well, that's great, but that's not the IS, and we need you to make a donation to the IS. And I thought, I was just dumbfounded. My goodness, you know, the person just donated $100,000. It's not just like, what have you done for me lately a week from now? It was like, what have you done for me lately five minutes from then? I just, that's where it just starts to get so extreme. And then after a while, with all the different pressures and the different things, because I would, would uh, reg someone or ask someone to donate, say, $30,000, $35,000 to become a patron of the IAS, the next week that person was being asked to buy $10,000 worth of books. And then the next week that person was asked to do something else, and I was just starting to feel that there was so much greed. And I just, it was making me physically ill, actually. I just, I just couldn't do it anymore. When there's a disaster, the IAS exploits that. So say, for example, with Hurricane Katrina. Right after that happened, the IAS regs went after for donations, and they really try to guilt you. Don't you care about those people who lost their homes, people who are separated from their families and have nowhere to go? We're helping those people with your donations. We need you to contribute as much money as you can. And they also work on sending some of their um, Scientology volunteer ministers to go out to the disaster sites. They do it mostly, I believe, for public relations, to get photos at these disaster sites. So when the next one occurs, they can say, look at the previous disaster. We were out there helping. But in reality, they're not really helping. They're just using that disaster as a way to disseminate Scientology. So at the disaster site, they'll deliver assists, which are basically like light touches on the body that help you go into communication with yourself, they say. But in reality, that's not really helping with like the cleanup and actual real stuff that they need help with at these disaster sites. And the money they raise, maybe like one to 5% is actually going towards, say, Hurricane Katrina, for example. The rest is just going into, you know, the leader's pockets and is used to fund other things that aren't even having to do with the disaster. But they use, say, for example, the disaster to get more money out of Scientologists. And it's wrong. The Sea Org is the religious order of the Church of Scientology. Their members are kind of maybe like what a priest would be in a Catholic church. They're the church management. They're the auditors, which are basically like counselors. And Sea Org members have to sign billion-year contracts to be a member of the Sea Org. Now, they sign a billion-year contract because they believe they come back lifetime after lifetime. And in your new life, you are expected to come back as a Sea Org member and re-sign up for service. The PTSD that I suffer from is because of these Sea Org recruitment cycles that they put me through on a daily basis. Now, they don't take no for an answer. On their routing forms, they go through a process to recruit a new person into the Sea Organization. And the end product of that is a Sea Org member who signed up and ready to begin. 
Now, until you're ready to sign that contract, they will go for hours and hours and hours and hours until they reach that end product, which is you joining the Sea Organization. I never joined the Sea Org. So they would just keep me for hours, locked in these rooms, recruiting me, abusing me emotionally, and just trying to get me to sign that Sea Org contract. Now they would say, you are being selected to be a Sea Org member. This is the most elite and important mission that you can undertake in this lifetime. And we need you to understand that it's just your reactive mind that's holding you back from joining the Sea Organization and your silly you know, purposes and goals to maybe want to be in the entertainment industry. You can't do that. You have to be a Sea Org member now. And they would just keep me for hours and they would never let me go. And I have so many traumatic memories of being recruited into the Sea Org. Now they say this is the most elite and important mission in the world that you can undertake. Now why aren't people lined up outside the recruiter's offices like begging to join? They're putting all this force and pressure and abusive behaviors onto me to get me to join. But you know, why aren't people you know, begging to join this group? There must be something off. And that's what I learned. All these Sea Org atrocities and abuses that happen. Just Google Scientology Sea Organization. Go on Amazon and look up books on Scientology. There are a number of books about abuses that happen inside the Sea Organization. Now, for example, say you were in the Sea Org for 15 or 20 years and you leave. You owe the amount of money that they pay to train you in their courses. You have to pay back your expenses. It's called your freeloader bill. So there are Sea Org members who, after they leave the Church of Scientology, after maybe 15, 20 years of dedicated service, they may get a bill for a half a million dollars. They suggest to women to have an abortion if they get pregnant, if they're a Sea Org member, because they believe a kid's just going to hold back a woman from their mission as being a Sea Org member because it requires a lot of devotion and you can't have a kid. So they'll say, look, you know, if you want to be a Sea Org member, this is what you got to do. And they recommend that they have an abortion. Now, sure, they can say, no, I'm not having an abortion, but they'll be kicked out of the Sea Org. Now, if you're in the Sea Org for 20 or 30 years and this is all you know, you have no other life skills, you have no money, you don't have a credit card, you don't have anything you're gonna follow Scientology's orders. They're gonna put the pressure on you to maybe have the abortion, or else they'll demote you to one of their lower organizations. And that's maybe not an option for you because you may not be able to support yourself in the outside world and be a regular staff member. So what happens? A lot of women are forced to have abortions by the Church of Scientology. The Jameses say their troubles with Scientology began when they wanted to have a baby. When Lucy became pregnant in 1990, she says she was pressured to have an abortion. I was escorted to the ethics division and then I was put in a room and then a, a gentleman came in and sat down and said, you know, this is wrong, you know, you need to terminate the pregnancy. They told you that flat out? Oh yeah, oh yeah. There's a punishment program that Sea Org members may be put on which is called the Rehabilitation Project Force or RPF. So say your stats are really down or you're not producing or you do something that's you know against the aims of the Church of Scientology. They can force you to go on this program. Now this program is basically manual labor. You may be digging ditches for Scientology. You may be painting walls. You're doing manual hard labor from sun up to sundown and you're doing it with another person until you come to the realization that, you know, Scientology is good and I'm going to reform and I'm going to really, you know, try to, you know, produce for this group. So they say, oh, look, you know, this program is totally voluntary. It's up to the Sea Org member to decide whether or not to do the program and get into good graces with the church or you have to route out of the Sea Org and you have to leave and you can never do Scientology again. Because they're saying to a lot of ex-members, well, look, you know, the program's voluntary. You don't have to subject yourself to that. Well, of course, not anyone could, you know, walk out the front door. But Scientology has these spiritual traps. You either do the program and you can become a Sea Org member again. You have no money. You have no car, no home. You have basically nothing. All your family and friends are inside the church. They'll say that you can't do the bridge to total freedom, especially if you have to, you know, depart Scientology in this way. So what do you have? They place you in that trap. So what do people do? They end up spending years on the rehabilitation project force being tortured, trying to get into good graces with the church again. And they abuse these members. And 
eventually maybe they do get back to being Sea Org members. But just the amount of spiritual and emotional and the amount of um, distress they place on them under this program, they're more controlled, they're more weak-willed, and they really just beat these members down horribly. Actors are the perfect candidate to be Sea Org members. Actors come out to LA full of hopes and dreams and they try to pursue their acting career month after month, day after day. But it's expensive to live in Los Angeles. It's expensive to market yourself as an actor, to take these classes. It's not easy. And it's not easy even getting a day job just to support your acting career. Now if you become a Scientologist and be an actor, you know, they're gonna start trying to get you to join the C organization. And you know, at first you're gonna be like, no, like I was, I'm very ambitious. I don't want to join the C org. I wanna pursue my acting career. But they may catch you at a time where you had a, maybe like a really bad audition, or you may realize like, look, I'm never gonna be a main stage act. Maybe now I can be in the C organization. Maybe I could live at the church, I can sing, I can dance, I can be an actor. Whatever it is that you do, they'll promise you that you can do that inside the C organization. All your expenses are paid for, and you're a real true believer maybe at this point in Scientology. So they get these really talented people to join the C organization. And then they kind of switch the plate and say, you know what, right now we need this post filled where you know you can maybe be a registrar, for example, or a core supervisor. And at this point, you might have given up your car, you sold your home, you might have given up everything. Or maybe you didn't have anything to start with and Scientology is the way that you can avoid being homeless. So what do you do? You go off and be a core supervisor and you give up on all your artistic dreams. Scientology makes you forget all about them. Being a Sea Org member isn't as glamorous as they say it is. You may work 80 to 100 hours a week for the church and you get $50 a week. It doesn't get any higher, any lower than that. You make your standard base $50. Now that $50, you know, may be going towards, say, like shampoo or soap or just your basic living essentials. Or maybe you're turning that money over to the International Association of Scientologists. So that money that you make basically goes back to Scientology, so you never really have like that escape route of maybe saving money and being able to use it towards anything. You make a very low amount of money you're working these excruciating amount of hours. You can't leave the Scientology base unless you go off with someone, and that's very rare. You don't get vacations. You may have two or three days a year to take a vacation day, but they're gonna say, look, you know, your statistics aren't up, or, you know, um, we, we're short-staffed right now. We really need you to stay here. So there are people who work, you know, pretty much year-round every single day, including holidays, for the Church of Scientology. When you're in the sea, you're totally isolated from the outside world. You get no cell phone, you're not able to use your email, any mail that you get to you is read by someone first. So you, you may not even get your mail, especially if there's something that's you know critical of Scientology, they're not gonna pass your mail along to you. So you're totally secluded from the outside world, especially because you can't read the newspaper. There may be in Theta or bad things in there about Scientology and you can't read that. Can't read a magazine. You're not gonna be able to sit down and watch TV or go to the movies. So they totally just seclude you into the Scientology lifestyle by being a Sea Org member. As I'm on a lunch break from course, I see two different staff recruiters approach the table, and they were recruiting for the new ideal org that was opening up in our area. So they come up to my table and they ask me if they can do a survey on me. And I just say, okay, I'm already on my lunch break, let's just see what they say. So they're asking these questions like, you know, do you agree that people are starving to death and people are using drugs and the state of our planet is just in horrible decay right now? And I'm like, um, okay. Yeah, I guess that's true. Um, you know, do you think that, you know, Scientology can help improve the state of this planet and that, you know, we need to go out there and really just push our message out there? Yeah, I'm a Scientologist at the point, I believe that. Well, by joining staff, you're going to be able to get rid of this downward spiral. You're going to be able to be able to help improve the conditions on this planet. And I just was, you know, trying to be polite. I'm telling them, no, I'm not interested. Because at this time, to be a staff member, you had to sign either a two and a half or a five year contract. And you have to work pretty much a minimum of 40 hours a week for the church, at day or at night. Now during the day, I needed to keep my days open. I was doing background and stand-in work and I was also auditioning for TV and film roles. So I don't really have the time to 
commit, say, nine to five to Scientology. Well, you could work in the evenings. Well, I wanted those evenings to devote towards my acting career. And my whole thing was, look, I'm going to be able to disseminate Scientology on such a grand scale by being a famous actor. I'm going to be able to be like Tom Cruise and go on Oprah's couch and be able to talk about the powers of Scientology. I had every intention on doing that for Scientology because I believed that they were helping me. But, you know, they didn't want to hear any of that. They want me to be a staff member. So one of the guy goes off and he's talking to his boss and they're trying to find different ways to handle me. And they knew my acting career was a big button for me. My acting career was my main thing in life. I had to be successful as an actor or else my life didn't have meaning at that time. I was really ambitious and really motivated and that's why I wouldn't join staff. So they needed to try to figure out a way to get me to join. And you know there's just a point where they just got really upset because we're spending hours and hours of them trying to recruit me at this point. Actors are scum. They're, you're not gonna be like no Tom Cruise or some shit. No, none of you actors in this place are. You're just wasting your time unnecessarily in these acting classes and auditioning. You're not going to really be able to help anyone as an actor. Actors are just downtone people. You're portraying those type of people in your work. You're portraying, say, psychiatrists. Maybe you're pursuing a homeless person or you're just, you know, taking on that beingness of those characters. Now, you don't want to take on the beingness and take on the persona of these horrible, horrible types of people in the world. No one's going to see the film that you're self-producing anyways. You are a Scientologist now. You have been here and you understand our mission. And our mission is clearing this planet and helping improve the state of this planet with Scientology. And we're not going to do that by just having other people like you just, you know, take this like passive role and just try to, you know, pursue their silly dreams of being an actor. They thought, you know, just give up on being an actor and become a staff member now. And I'm thinking, okay, now this is a church that L. Ron Hubbard is, you know, saying that artists are like the most valuable people to society. You know, he thinks like, you know, artists are contributing in such a big way. He said that a culture is only as great as its dreams, as its dreams are dreams by artists. And they can create such aesthetic, beautiful things in this world, these artists. But yet, you know, the tables turn and they say, look, you know, that's great and all about your silly dreams, but you know, you can, you know, have your past memories about them and now it's time to take responsibility and become a staff member. But I saw the out point about it. I saw that the church is, you know, promoting artists and then when you get in a little bit more, they bait and switch and say, you know what, that whole artist thing is all bullshit. You know, it really rubbed me the wrong way because I'm thinking, well, maybe you know, there are other courses or other things are going to switch up on me. And I've already donated all this time and money, so I'm still really invested and I still really believe in it. But just something was off. I just really felt depressed at this point and I just didn't know what to do. And I just told them, no, it's not going to happen. And they're yelling at me and they're screaming at me and they're telling me I'm one, one on the tone scale. I'm equivalent to a criminal. I'm a horrible person. And there's no reason why a real true Scientologist wouldn't join staff. And the way that they emotionally abused me for hours and hours, day after day, month after month, I knew that being a staff member was just going to be a horrible, horrible experience because look at how they're treating me now just to get me to join. I knew there was something wrong. If they had to be so abusive towards me just to get me to join, it must not be as good as they say it is. So I didn't join staff at that time. So one time I was at one of the events and two SEO recruiters brought me to the back to try to recruit me. Now my stance amongst most of these SEO recruiters, they know it's a no. I'm not going to join and it's not going to happen so don't waste your time. So while I'm in the process of being recruited by these two Sea Org members, another two approach the table and they start getting really angry and they tell these guys not to waste their time on me. Steve's a pussy. He needs to grow a pair of balls and handle and confront what the condition on this planet is and he can't do that. He's just a sissy. He's not gonna be able to be in the Sea organization. Don't waste your time trying to recruit this just basically like this piece of shit. They just said it straight out. And to think that these people are supposed to be these elite members of society and they're willing just to talk to a future potential recruit and they're willing to say these sort of horrible things about me. It just made me more, you know, 
willing just to say no and this isn't going to happen. I'm not going to join the Sea Org. I just totally was like, look, after hearing that, I was on my way out of Scientology. Little did they know. At another event, I had these two really hot Sea Org members come up to try to recruit me. And I basically shut them down right away and I said, look, I'm not going to join the Sea Org. It's not going to happen. Don't waste your time with me. I'm just going to tell you no. They're, they're laughing and they're like, look, we know you're not interested in joining the Sea Org, but we want to show you this presentation and these videos and we really want to show you what the Sea Org is actually about so you can see what we do and you can just have a little bit more of affinity for our group because you can see the dedication us Sea Org members put in. So I'm thinking, well, you know, okay, these are these two cool hot Sea Org members. Let me give them a shot and see what, see what it's about. They said no pressure. They're not going to try to recruit me. Let's just hang out and have a coffee. So they decided to meet me at the coffee bean next door of my house. Just let us know what time's good for you and we'll meet tomorrow. So the next day comes around and it's a bait and switch. It's not the two hot Sea Org members. It's some ugly ball guy and some really dorky looking girl. So I'm like, just like everything else in Scientology, they can't just follow through on what they say. So I'm sitting there at the coffee bean and I'm watching all these really crazy propaganda videos, how the psychs are destroying the world, how everything we see in the media is basically through these companies that have different psych messages that they implant into us and how we need to audit out mankind's fourth dynamic engram and that's what's holding us back in life because we all have this same engram that's implanted into us that you know Sea Org members are working to eradicate and you know we're going to be able to clear this planet and they're just really going on like really kooky like I was in Scientology for a while and I was kind of aware of some of their aims and missions and some of these different kind of things but just all of it together was really kooky. I mean, they're showing me like a Britney Spears music video and showing how she's promoting, you know, deviant sexual behaviors and how, you know, in the Sea Org we're working to erase those type of things from people who get those messages inside of themselves and start acting out sexually. It's crazy. And I really like Britney Spears, so I, I automatically like discredited everything that they said about, you know, Britney's message. Anyways, so they start really hitting me to join the Sea Organization. And I said, look, this is you guys already knew. I told those other two guys that I wasn't going to join the Sea Organization. And I feel pressured and I'm not going to, you know, join the Sea Organization. Well, the pressure is your reactive mind and your questioning answer back and forth. You can make the decision to be a Sea Org member right now. And there doesn't have to be any pressure. We don't care if you join the Sea Org or not. We're just trying to look after you and help you. So I get into the whole thing about my career and how I'm not going to give up my career to be um, a Sea Org member. So the girl, you know, she's like a young girl. She's maybe like 18 or 19 or something like that. And she starts talking to me. She's like, look, you know, my whole life I was a musician. And I really just wanted to go out there and make effects with my music career. And I had the opportunity to do that because I got um, some sort of like a um, development deal through a record company. But I gave that up to be a Sea Org member because she felt like she saw the real purpose of what the Sea Org was about after watching this crazy video. But I saw the pain in her eyes. I see how upset she was, even though she wasn't really showing it, but I, could, I can read through people. And I saw how sad she was. And I'm like, look, the Sea Org is ripping apart people from you know promising careers and just a family life. And it's just that they just really hurt these people and they really mess them up because they feel like they have to do Scientology or else, you know, whatever else they were doing was just meaningless in life. So I'm sitting there, and at that point, I, I mean, there was a point where I was really vulnerable and my career wasn't really moving, and there might have been a chance that they could have maybe have caught me to join the Sea Org at one of these, you know, junctures. But at this point, I'm like, it's not going to happen. No, I like, I, I couldn't give up that career. I was so motivated. I just had to make it happen for myself. So I told them no. And they go off on me. They're yelling at me. You are a horrible, disgusting excuse for a human being. You shouldn't even be living right now because you don't contribute anything into this world. They're screaming at me at the top of their lungs inside the coffee bean. And I'm saying, just like I said before, there's no way that the Sea Org is this beautiful, ethical, amazing group that they make it out to be. They're abusing their members. And they're abusing me right now emotionally telling me that I'm not going to go up the bridge in Scientology. Basically, everything in my life is, you know, it's just gone to hell, basically, because you're not willing to attain that spiritual freedom by being in the Sea Org. 
And at that point, I'm like, look, I need to take a little Scientology break. So I took a break for a little while, but that didn't stop them from continuously trying to get me to join the Sea Organization. This really pretty Sea Org member from the Celebrity Center saw me check into one of their events, which was their maiden voyage event, which they hold every summer. So I came there alone and she was trying to, you know, befriend me. I really want to interview you because I told her about my acting career. She's like, look, can we do like a quick interview before we go into this event? And I'm thinking, well, the event's going to start in like 20 or 30 minutes, so it's not like we have a lot of time to do an actual interview, but I'll be happy to, thinking she's going to ask me questions about the industry or whatever. So she starts asking me questions like, you know, have you ever done LSD before? Do you have any psychiatric history? Have you ever been institutionalized? She's basically trying to qual me for the C organization to see if I'm qualified. But of course they have to try to find tricks to get you to actually go through with the whole recruitment cycle because no one's gonna agree if they say, let me just re you know, recruit you to the C organization. She's asking me all these questions. Just to find out if I'm qualified, it's not any pressure to actually join if I actually am. Of course I am because I have a pretty clean slate in life. I haven't really murdered or killed anyone and I don't have excessive debts. All the things that they ask you before joining the Sea Organization. So we're at the Hollywood and Highland Center where the event is at the Kodak Theater. And you know, I'm there at the end of the event for like eight hours with this Sea Org recruiter. And, you know, at first she's just trying to be my friend and she's trying to tell me about, you know, how, you know, I'm going to meet so many people in the C organization and we're all actors too. So don't worry about like having to give up your acting career. We're all actors and you could be an actor in the C org. Now, like I've said, being an actor in the Sea Org isn't like being an actor out in the real world. You can't audition for a TV show. You're not going to be on Modern Family. You're going to be in, you know, one of their Dianetics DVDs. If you're lucky to actually have the chance to be in one of their Scientology films as a Sea Org member. So they try to trick actors and feel like, well, you know, we're also actors too. You're going to meet so many nice people and we're all creative and we're all trying to, you know, help forward L. Ron Hubbard's message and this is what you want, right? So they lay it on really hard. They put the CR contract and the pen in my hand. They say, look, you're in on the greatest push in the last 2,500 years. You're going to be an auditor and you're going to help us clear this planet. And we're not basically taking no for an answer because we're trying to help you. And we know it's your reactive mind that's holding you back from actually joining. So just listen to us, trust us, and sign the contract. I wasn't budging. I had the contract in my hand and I'm like, what do I do? I've never actually had the contract in the pen and actually been told, sign the contract right now. And we're going to announce you too. We're going to announce you to this whole event. You're going to go on stage in front of thousands of people and we're going to announce you as our newest Sea Org member. And they were just trying anything to try to, you know, make me feel like, okay, I'm going to do it right now because you can't think about it. If you think about it, what they say, most people don't join if they think about it because they find all the reasons in the world. They let the outside world influence them. They may, you know, have a home or a car or other things. They're not seeing the real purpose of what the Sea Org is about that they're presenting right now. And if you can agree and put that intention here right now to join the Sea Org, then, you know, all those other things aren't going to matter. We'll help you sell your home, your car, whatever. So they really put pressure on you to join right now. So the girl tells me, she's like, look, I cried when I signed my Sea Org contract. I didn't necessarily want to, you know, do it. I had other goals and things that I wanted to do in my life, but I joined and now my life is better. Now life is actually meaningful because I'm able to help so many people. And, you know, I was almost ready to cry because I just wanted to go home after these long Sea Org cycles. So I had all these other recruiters around me and they said, look, can we schedule a meeting for tomorrow? And we're going to show you videos and they're going to basically, you know, show me what being a Sea Org member at the Celebrity Center was like. So I said, okay. At the time I said, okay, sure, I'll come in tomorrow at 11 in the morning because that was the only way to get out of you know, the Hollywood and Highland Center that night and be able to go home. Because if I didn't say that, that I'd be willing to agree to meet with them, I would have had to sign that contract because they don't take no for an answer. Their end product is Sea Org member on post. So until I sign that contract, I'm screwed. So my way out was, I'm going to see you tomorrow. And I didn't show up to the org for a couple of weeks because I just couldn't handle being in these Sea Org cycles. But yet I went back and they continued. So one time I was locked in the Celebrity Center with one of their staff recruiters. It was about 3 a.m. and unbeknownst to us, we were actually locked in the building because they closed up shop for the night. So I'm in CC with the staff recruiter and he wouldn't let up. He's hitting me 
and he's not taking no for an answer. So it gets to a point where he starts to kind of like run like some form of like an auditing process on me, where he puts the contract in my hand and he puts the pen in my hand and he starts running a process and he starts going, put that pen on that paper. Thank you. You know, withdraw. Okay, good. Now put your pen on that paper. Good. Sign the contract. And now you think after you've been in there for like 10 hours and you're tired and you're weak and you're hungry and you haven't slept and you've been on course all day and you're reading these books and they're brainwashing in and of, of themselves, sign the contract. We won't even put it into effect. We just want to see if you can confront the contract and sign the contract. And then, of course, if you sign it, they'll say, oh, well, let's put it into effect. They already got your signature. They just do anything to get you to sign these contracts. So, you know, you start feeling kind of controlled and numb and you know you're like yes I'll put the pen on that paper and you're like well wait a minute you know I'm not uh, this is not what I'm I'm not signing up for this no you're not tricking me so we try to leave after hours and hours of him recruiting me and the doors locked we found out that they locked the front doors so then I remember from the purification program, they have a back door that if you kind of hip chuck it, it locks the other way so then we can escape out of the back of the celebrity center. Because I'm thinking, oh crap, I'm going to be stuck here at this Sea Org recruiter until tomorrow morning and then he's just going to keep hitting me and hitting me and hitting me to join staff. And I wasn't budging for it. But to be in Scientology and to continue on with my services, I had to sit through these sewer recruitment cycles. So in one sewer recruitment cycle, I had a woman screaming in my face. She told me I'm an enemy of the Church of Scientology, and we are the effing brave ones who can confront the conditions of this planet, and we are the ones who are on, you know, like the front lines of the church, and we are the reasons why you public members are able to receive Scientology services. And don't you want Scientology to be here in another 20, 40, 50 years for your kids, for your friends, and being able to really help other people in this world? Well, you're not able to, you know, help forward Scientology if you're not going to be a Sea Org member. So she should just keep attacking and attacking me and yelling at me and just emotionally just going at me, telling me I'm just this horrible person. And I just couldn't believe how hard that they would just keep hitting me and this was right before I left the church and this was kind of like the last straw for me I wasn't willing to be put up with these abuses so this woman tried every trick in the book we'll make you an auditor we'll let you work in the president's office where all the celebrities go through or you know you could basically have any job within Scientology you just name it we'll put it on your contract so you can work in that department of Scientology but I know how they bait and switch. They always say they'll work out the details with you after you sign the contract. In my 35 years in the Church of Scientology, there is one thing I learned very thoroughly. The Church of Scientology is homophobic, anti-gay. The fact of being gay is looked at as a kind of disease or even a mental condition. This is a religion that monetizes your gayness. Give us money and we'll audit that. If you're gay, you're a kind of subhuman, little bit batty, little bit loony, little bit... It's a disease and we give us $100,000 and we'll get the gay exercised out of you. I do not know of one person in 35 years whether they gave $100,000 to the Church of Scientology or half a million dollars to the Church of Scientology. They were still gay. L. Ron Hubbard was an extremely homophobic man. He was. He was anti-gay. His son was gay. He ended up either killing himself or being killed. I'm not sure which, but he was found dead in a desert. People that are gay have a very hard time in Scientology because they're basically saying there's something wrong with you and you need more auditing to fix it. Here's the absolute truth. If anybody just happens to be lurking and you're in Scientology, that's a complete lie. It is not true at all. You don't need to get fixed at all, okay? Some of the top people in Scientology, there's a bunch of people that are gay that are in Scientology. Um, one of the more famous ones 
rumor has it is John Travolta that he's at least bisexual. I know he's married, he has children, but from what I've heard and seen, I mean, he's kissing a man on the lips. He's been found and known to be in different places. I don't really care what his sexuality is. That's fine with me. But Johnny, why are you staying in a homophobic group? I don't understand that. I really don't. I know, you're, now you're going to really go into being straight, but I wish you'd be honest and straight with yourself. It would really be healthy and good for you and for everybody else, okay? Because um, there's another man in Scientology that often sues people if they say he's gay, Tom, Tr Tom Cruise. Now, Tommy, I don't give a damn what sexuality you are either, but don't you be sending private investigators over to my friend's houses because I thanked you on TV for setting a good example as a Scientologist. That's all I did. I said, I think Tom Cruise did a great job showing people what an OT looks like. And you know what? They, Scientology sent private investigators to two of my friends' houses to see if I was libeling Tom Cruise. Well, I'm not libeling you, Tommy. I don't give a damn. I just think it's pretty odd for a man to sue people because they say he's gay. Who cares? If you're not, why would you care? Why would you possibly sue someone because of that? You cannot be a Scientologist and be gay. I mean, take a few minutes if you're gay you can walk into a church and see how the people react towards you they kind of keep their distance from you they're weirdos and um i i'm gay and i was in the sea org for three years and i actually was kicked out because i started to develop a relationship with a fellow male staff member and um obviously you can't do that i mean really gay people are considered to be evil and i for a long time thought i was evil they love gay money when gays pay in tens of thousands of dollars or hundreds of thousands of dollars, as, as I did, I paid in almost a half a million dollars to Scientology. They love that. They'll accept any gay checks, any gay cash, anything like that. But as soon as you stop paying, ah, you're back into the 1.1 crowd again. Ah, you're not worth even bothering with anymore. Hubbard wanted to kill off all gay people. Even, even in his science fiction books, I mean, in the last science fiction, I think it was Mission Earth, which he wrote, um, he rounds up all the gay people in this whole uh, civilization, puts them on one island, and in the, uh, in the end, the island is blown up, and there's no survivors. L. Ron Hubbard believed that you could audit out the gay. He believed that being gay was 1-1 one, one on the tone scale, which is basically the very bottom of his tone scale. The very top being serenity of beingness, total happiness, and you're basically a totally in ethics, you're a great person. He believed that when you're one one, you are equivalent to a pedophile, you're a pervert, criminals are one ones. So basically, you're gay, you're equivalent to a sexual pervert criminal. And one one's just right above body death, which is at zero. So you're pretty much just barely even, you know, recognizes even a person at this level. They just think that you're just some sort of criminal in their eyes. But by auditing, you can go up the tone scale and you can become more um, ethical. You're going to start, you know, auditing and you're going to start erasing these different engrams from your mind that are the reason why they think that you're gay. Because maybe one of these different incidents in your mind, you'll start going over it with your auditor and then it'll blow and then, hey, maybe you'll be straight. That's what they're hoping for, that maybe you'll reach the very first incident where you realize you're gay and then you can audit it out. It's nonsense. You can't change someone who's gay, who's lesbian, who's bisexual. You can't, com you can't make them completely straight. There's no way possible. That's why they ban these conversion therapies. Gay conversion therapy is illegal. You can't try to change someone. This is just common knowledge. So this scam has been sold for years, and finally it is now in California. It is against the law and Scientology and the state of California are going to uh, have an unpleasant interaction shortly because the law is you cannot, whatever you want to call it, auditing, psychotherapy, uh, whatever it is, you are not allowed to promote or engage in quote, reparative therapy, because it isn't reparative. Uh, federal courts have now upheld the California law, um, and, 
and under the guise of a religion, you are not allowed to engage in this practice, um, even though you claim it's part of your religious practice. Now, I get these books are written in 1950, but they're still practi practicing this to this day. They're still practicing auditing gay people and promising them that they'll be able to become straight. No, it's not right. And these people are being so trapped in the closet because now they're not able to be who they really are. They may try dating and marrying a woman. And there are these actors who, I'm not naming any names, but they're rumored to be in the closet because of Scientology. It is madness. So I'm going to be reading out of Dianetics what L. Ron Hubbard said about homosexuality. The sexual pervert and by this term, Dianetics, to be brief, includes any and all forms of deviation in dynamic too, such as homosexuality, lesbianism, sexual sadism, etc., and all down the catalog of Alice and Kraft Ebbing is actually quite ill physically. And he goes on to say, And the sum of it is, is that the pervert is always a very ill person in one way or another, whether he is conscious of it or not. He is very far from culpable for his condition, but he is also so far from normal and so extremely dangerous to society that the tolerance of perversion is as thoroughly bad for society as punishment for it. So in Handbook for Preclears, LRH talks to auditors and tells them basically how they can audit out the gay. Now it may not make a lot of sense to the normal person, but just to go to show you how he talks about auditing out the gay. An individual aberrated enough about sex will do strange things to be a cause or an effect. He will substitute punishment for sex. He will pervert other. Homosexuality comes from this manifestation and from the manifestation of life continuation for others. A boy whose mother is dominant will try to continue her life from any failure she has. A girl whose father is dominant will try to continue his life from any failure he has. The mother or the father was cause in the child's eyes. The child elected himself successor to cause. Break this life continuum concept by running sympathy and grief for the dominant parent and then run off the desires to be in effect and their failures and the homosexual is rehabilitated. Homosexuality is about one one on the tone scale. So is general promiscuity. So I was going out to lunch with a friend of mine who's currently still in the church. And I went to lunch with her about you know a few months ago. So it's pretty recent. So basically, I was kind of expressing some of my doubts in Scientology. So you're talking about the LGBT stance of L. Ron Hubbard. So I basically was telling her what L. Ron Hubbard said about homosexuals, which I just basically read two of the most prominent things that he says about them. And then I was telling her how I didn't think it was right. So then she takes a moment and she thinks and she says, well, um, was it a short mention? I'm sure you only mentioned it briefly. Like having it just be like a very small mention would actually make it any less significant. It's still L. Ron Hubbard. He still said it. He still put it in his book and people are receiving auditing to audit out their homosexuality. So therefore, it's not just a little tiny mention in a book. It's actually a very big thing because it's still going on to this day. If their homosexuality stances change, why not remove it from these books? Why not have a public stance towards homosexuality and that it's not something that you can just audit away? Why don't they try to cover up their tracks? They can't because they still believe these type of things. And their members are being trained to try to like overlook it, like, oh, it's not a big deal that he says that being gay is wrong. You can't discriminate against people, especially a religious group. A real religious group is going to be totally supportive of who you are, try to help you embrace who you are, and not discriminate against certain people. For example, you can't go to FLAG, which is the spiritual mecca of Scientology, the big hub in Clearwater, Florida, if you're gay. It's just not going to happen. They basically will say, yes, you, I mean, you can be gay, but you can't engage in homosexual behaviors. You can't be with a guy. You can't basically be yourself because you're going there probably to audit it out. But they don't want you to have a relationship or anything. Even so, they, they're, they're just not for it. Plain and simple. And no religious group who's legitimate should be telling people not to be who they are. Embrace it. So this is kind of another one of those signs where you say, hmm, is this really a spiritual, happy place where they let you be who you are and you know kind of develop who you are and understand yourself more, are they just repressing it? Are they suppressing you? And that's what Scientology does to gay people. At one point, I, I was ranting and raving about 
Proposition 8 <clears throat> and uh, the, the ballot initiative that was funded by, in part, the Mormon Church. And uh, you said, well, yeah, it's terrible. I said, well, you do realize that Scientology financially supported Proposition 8. Oh, no, that's not true. That's absolutely not true. How do you know that? I said, well, they have to file disclosure forms. And a, a lot of money was donated by the Church of Scientology to either directly or indirectly fund the ballot initiative on Prop 8. In fact, that's why the director, I don't know how to pronounce his last name, Haggis, Paul Haggis, uh, I think he directed Leaving Las Vegas. Anyway, he had a public break with Scientology, and the reason he did, he's straight, but he had a public break because he didn't like what the Church of Scientology was doing on Proposition 8 and how it dealt with gay people. Proposition 8 was a California initiative to block gay marriage. I was out with my daughters trying to do picketing and donating money to try and uh, stop Proposition 8. And then I found out that a, a branch of the church was supporting it, and I got very upset. Is Scientology a cult? Oh, of course it is. Of course it is. It's, it's, uh, it's a system of belief that I mean, you've got these folks inside this fortress who, who won't look out and won't look at any criticism and can't bear to, to, to any investigation and, and think that everyone is against them. How would you describe that? It's a cult. Of course it is. There, it was sort of an argument between us, and, and, and the next time if I said, well, I want to go to this restaurant, oh, how do you know they haven't donated to, Pro to Proposition 8? You know, you were, you were sort of zinging me whenever I wanted to patronize this store. And I said, well, I, I knew if a business had done that or not. And then there was sort of a shift where one day you were saying something, and in, in the context of it, you said something like, well, the San Diego org may have given money to support Proposition 8, but blah, 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 blah. And that was sort of the first kernel that I thought that you had done a little research on your own and discovered that what I was saying was true. But I, I kind of let things drop after I made my point, because I think the worst thing to do to someone when you think they're in a cult is to counter-pressure them uh, I just think it's counterproductive, and if the person's otherwise smart and they're not w in that environment 24-7, you lived on your own, you had your own place, you were spending a lot of time here, I just figured I'd let you come to your own conclusions and you were smart enough to figure it out. The, the reason I was alarmed about Scientology was I never got involved in it the only contact I had was about 25 years ago when I was in law school and I was sort of, I, I wouldn't say dating, but I would say seeing somebody occasionally once a month, yeah, I guess is the euphemism we're going to use. And um, he would go to Scientology for the purpose of becoming, quote, clear on not being gay, since they equate that with um, being a criminal. And so he would leave Scientology where he was in some sort of program to de-gay himself and then come over to my house and spend the weekend. So I thought that was kind of interesting. It has never worked. Read, I would say, read Mel White's bio autobiography. He was Jerry Falwell's right-hand man in the religious right. And for years, for 30 years, he tried to, quote, pray away the gay. Whether you call it praying away the gay or auditing away the gay, whatever label you want to put on it, it's the same thing. It's flim-flammery. It's horn swoggledry. And it's just a technique and a tool of... Uh, of subjugating people and, and getting their money. So the question on everyone's mind is, where's Shelley? Now, Shelley is David Miscavige's wife, who's the current leader of the Church of Scientology. Now, she hasn't been seen publicly in several years. 
No one really knows where she is. No one has heard from her. No one can actually back up with any proof that they've actually had any sort of interaction with her and that she's actually okay. So it's just been this big ongoing question that everyone's been asking, this big ongoing investigation. Where's Shelly Miscavige? Is she okay? Where is she and how can we help her? The actress Leah Remini, famous for her role in the CBS sitcom The King of Queens. I took a leap of faith for you. You didn't take a leap of faith for me. Taking her confrontation with the controversial Church of Scientology to a new level. Leah Remini, who was the most recent celebrity to defect from Scientology, was actually friends with Shelley Miscavige. And over the holidays, they would send each other gifts back and forth, and they would send letters and write to each other. But all of a sudden, Shelley stopped responding to Leah. So she's just kind of wondering, like, what the hell is going on? So it was at Tom Cruise's wedding to Katie Holmes where she saw David Miscavige and no Shelley. So she had the balls to ask David Miscavige, where Shelley? And because she's wondering, well, this is a big high profile event for David Miscavige's best friend, Tom Cruise. Why isn't Shelley at the wedding? It just only would make sense that she would be there. So Tommy Davis, who was kind of like the like media and PR type of person of Scientology, he actually recently left the Church of Scientology after a number of years. His mother is actually Ann Archer, the actress. Anyways, at the time, he basically told Leah, you don't have the effing rank to ask about Shelley. Meaning she's not like important, she doesn't have enough power to actually ask where Shelley actually is. So when Leah got back to L.A. after the wedding, she wrote up a knowledge report on David Miscavige, basically because she knew something was up. What's going on? So then after just a number of years of being interrogated, which they just continued to interrogate her and figuring out why she would ask such a question, and they would figure out what her evil purposes were. After they did all of that, her and her family just decided, okay, enough is enough. They can't produce Shelley. And there's just a number of outpoints about the Church of Scientology. So she left the Church of Scientology because of this Shelley Miscavige. That's what kind of started the ball rolling for her to question, okay, something's up. And for such a public figure, being an actress, in her case, she was a very public Scientologist. She's been one her whole life. She decided to leave. So it's just... It's important for celebrities to actually take responsibility and leave the Church of Scientology because there's just a number of abuses, there are a number of unanswered um, questions, and they really just have to stand up and not just put up with the BS of the Church of Scientology because they're representing the Church of Scientology by being public members. But now this. ABC News confirming that Remini filed a missing persons report with the Los Angeles Police Department on the wife of the man who runs the Church of Scientology, David Miscavige. Shelley has not been seen publicly in many years, making her current whereabouts a source of feverish speculation among the church's many critics. Ever since day one, I'm getting at least 15 to 30 calls, texts, and emails from them every single day. They never let up. You'll be on their mailing list for eternity. Once you give them your number, don't expect them to ever stop calling you. Even if you tell them not to call you, they're still going to call you because they want to handle you. And they want to find out why. And they want you to come back into the org. So, I mean, you're never going to get off their phone call list. So I had to change my phone number. I moved, so I luckily don't get as much mail from them. But it would pour in. If I wouldn't be on course for a few days, I would get calls at all hours on my home number, my cell phone, you know, they would text me insanely. It was just incredible the amount of calls, the amount of mail I would come home to. So there are times when I wouldn't show up for course, for example, because I was obviously not a Scientologist anymore, at least within the walls of the Church of Scientology. They'd show up to my house. They would knock on my door. Even when I'm not home, I would get note shoved underneath my door from them saying that we came to your house and we were waiting for you you know let's set up a time for you and i to get together so i mean they stop at nothing okay i, I can see how in any normal group you can maybe say look don't call me never reach out to me again i don't want to hear from you but with them they say well this is perfect because now we know he's upset so now we can handle the reasons why he's upset and then he's going to become a member again because we just handled all the reasons why he didn't want to be a member of our church. So you're almost giving them um, 
information that's going to be used to basically, yeah, to keep you inside the church. Uh, these people would call, I mean, the telemarketers have nothing on these people. They would call uh, 40 times a day, 30 times a day. I thought he was exaggerating, but um, he wasn't. And there were always, it was a certain prefix. So he knew it was Scientology, so he wouldn't answer the phone. And I kept saying, well, why don't you just answer him and tell him not to call anymore? Oh, no, that won't work, and you don't understand. They'll try to, to, they'll look at it as an objection and an opportunity to bring me back in the fold. And I thought, oh, just tell him to go fuck off, you know. That sort of was my philosophy of it. But you were getting more and more agitated, and I was having to answer your phone more and more. And just to sort of bedevil these people, I would answer the phone in various uh, characters that I have created over the years. One was uh, an Armenian man from Glendale. One was an El Salvadoran maid. One w was uh, a um, toll booth collector from New Jersey. Uh, I, I have about 20 different characters. One was an elderly Jewish man from Fairfax at the deli. And I would answer the phone in this voice. But then he, he got paranoid about that, so he wanted me to always answer in the one voice. So he picked the El Salvadoran maid. And I would constantly answer the phone as the El Salvadoran maid, tell them in Spanish that Steve wasn't here, that they had the wrong number. But even though when I said that the number was incorrect in Spanish, whoever they had on the phone, you would think people in if they're based in Clearwater, Florida, and they have this huge presence in Los Angeles, they would have someone that could speak Spanish that would call up and speak to me in Spanish if I'm truly the maid answering the phone. They never did. It was always some fresh-faced white kid trying to talk to me on the phone that um, couldn't speak Spanish, but I would get across that they, they have the wrong number, this isn't Steve's number, don't call anymore. And then they would call again, as if I'm, I'm, well, I was lying to them, but they, they didn't know that. I mean, at some point, can you imagine if you really had the wrong number and they kept calling and calling and calling? And I think there's been a lawsuit over that at some point. But you were getting more and more anxious. Any time a piece of mail would arrive from there, you were getting more fearful, more anxious, more depressed, and... Um, you started watching some videos on Facebook posted uh, by a lady named Karen de la Carrier, and you would want me to watch them, and I thought she, she's an ex-Scientologist and exposing Scientology, and I thought they were a riot. She would portray herself as the ethics officer from the Sea Org with some hapless fool that was in there in trouble for God knows what, some, some one thing or another. And they were really funny, but they got their point across. And you seemed to take some comfort in them because you were both laughing and it would take your mind off the anxiety. So I decided to, to um, contact her and I just sent her an email through Facebook and I said, look, uh, my fiance, because I, I, by then we were engaged, my fiance is, you know, having a tough time. He's trying to leave Scientology. He, he, these people are constantly hectoring him, calling, mailing, pressuring. And um, I wanted to make sure she knew because you now have to think as if everything's the grassy knoll. You have to think in the conspiracy sort of mindset. So I told her I was a friend of Mark Ebner's so she would know. I wasn't some Scientologist secretly trying to harass her. And she was extremely gracious and she uh, got right back to me and she gave me her phone number and, and uh, we had her over for dinner, her, she and her husband. And uh, that was a, I, I think that was a helpful step on your road to making a, a break. 
But say, like me, I decide to have a little bit of a quiet departure from Scientology. I never actually verbalized to them and kind of had like a written resignation from them. But even so, they knew that I haven't been there in a while, and they're trying to get me to come back and be a member. So what do they do? They call you up 40 times a day. They send you texts. They send you emails. They mail you letters. They send you books. They send you postcards. They will never stop reaching out to you via any of those means. So, you know, you kind of live with, you know, Scientology on you all the time because, you know, you look at your phone, there's a Scientology text. You go in your email, there's an email. You go in your mailbox, there's a whole booklet of information for you. You can never really, like, escape from them fully because they think, well, if you left, the reason you leave is because maybe something's misunderstood. You might not have understood the philosophy properly. You might have a misunderstood word for example. And it sounds so silly, but that's what they believe. So they think, well, if we just get him in here, we can handle him and we can fix him. They don't understand that their overburdening amounts of um, communication are creepy. It's stalkerish. It's weird. They do anything and they stop at nothing. And people don't realize that. They think, oh, I can maybe just go to a Scientology center, maybe, and, you know, take a course. You're going to be on their list for life. So I wanted to read from L. Ron Hubbard again from his Keeping Scientology Working Bulletin, which every Scientologist has read before. This is easily found, and this is what L. Ron Hubbard says, and this is kind of why they don't let up on people. When somebody enrolls, consider he or she has joined up for the duration of the universe. Never permit an open-minded approach. If they're going to quit, let them quit fast. If they enrolled, they're aboard. And if they're aboard, they're here on the same terms as the rest of us, win or die in the attempt. Never let them be half-minded about being Scientologists. The finest organizations in history have been tough, dedicated organizations. Not one namby-pamby bunch of panty waist dilettantes have ever made anything. It's a tough universe. The social veneer makes it seem mild, but only the tigers survive, and even they have had a hard time. We'll survive because we are tough and are dedicated. When we do instruct someone properly, he becomes more and more tiger. When we instruct half-mindedly and are afraid to offend, scared to enforce, we don't make students into good Scientologists, and that lets everybody, everybody down. When Mrs. Patty Kate comes to us to be taught, turn that wandering doubt in her eye into a fixed, dedicated glare, and she'll win and we'll all win. Humor her and we'll all die a little. The proper instruction attitude is, you're here, so you're a Scientologist. Now we're gonna make you into an expert auditor no matter what happens. We'd rather have you dead than incapable. So if you leave Scientology, there's a policy that can be enforced called fair game. In fair game, L. Ron Hubbard says, um, someone who leaves may be deprived of property or injured by any means by any Scientologist without any discipline of the Scientologist, may be tricked, sued, or lied to or destroyed. So if you leave the church, they can employ this fair game policy, or they can basically have, you know, free reign to do whatever they want to you to try to intimidate you, to stop you from speaking out publicly, to stop you from, you know, they just basically want you to know that you can't mess with them because they don't want the word to get out that Scientology is a cult. They want other people to stay inside the walls of the Church of Scientology. And if they can shut up their critics and if they can shut up people who have defected, then, you know, they can continue on their group, organization. They can continue doing what they're doing. What, are, what, what specifically what you're referring to is if somebody is expelled from the church, um, anybody who insists on continuing to be connected to somebody who's been expelled from the church would be told that as long as they maintain that connection, they're not welcome in the church. So in Scientology, there's a policy called disconnection. And it's basically just like the practice of just shunning someone. So say for an example, I'm a Scientologist, and I have family or friends in the Church of Scientology. Well, if I leave Scientology, I'm no longer allowed to communicate to my family members who are inside of the church, because I'm now disaffected. I may be antagonistic, and they say that it's going to basically inhibit the spiritual um, process of enlightenment for the person who's currently in if they stay connected to the person who has left Scientology. So there are numerous stories of people who have disconnected from their parents, their friends. They basically lose their job if they work for a Scientologist because they end up just saying, well, we don't really need you anymore because, you know, they're suppressive. They can't work for our organization. 
So people have this really hard decision that they have to make because they're basically de deciding between their family, their friends, or the in the Church of Scientology, or basically they go off, they leave Scientology, they have no other job, they have no family or friends that are outside. Maybe you rent from a Scientologist for your apartment, so you may not want to live there anymore. So basically you have to restart your life all over again because um, you know, you, you don't have the connections that you once had inside the Church of Scientology. So now they would tell me, you know, maybe your father is antagonistic. And that's their way of kind of slowly telling you to disconnect from them. They would say, you know, maybe just fear roads good weather them. And fear roads good weather is basically just the way of um, asking how the roads are when you talk to someone. So if I was to talk to my dad, I wouldn't get into talking about my daily life or my Scientology, I would say, how is the weather? Oh, how are the roads? Is there a lot of traffic? Just to talk about that, just so we can stay in communication but not really talk about anything to them of substance. If you can't handle your family member through that means, you have to disconnect from them. So say, for example, my dad wasn't supportive of Scientology. I would have to disconnect from him because he's going to inhibit me from having gains in Scientology because I'm connected to this person who's antagonistic and doesn't want me to win in Scientology. He wants me to, you know, follow his belief system, for example. So you're basically left, after you leave Scientology, with none of your family, none of your friends, none of the connections that you once had. And some of those connections may have lasted 30 years, for example, 50 years, just because you decided to leave the Church of Scientology. Although it wasn't the case for me, there are numerous families that are broken up because of the Scientology disconnection policy. There are countless stories of parents who have received letters from their kids who decide to join the Sea Org. And basically, if the parents didn't approve of that decision or they weren't supportive about them going into the Sea Organization, for example, they would write a disconnection letter. And they'd basically say, you know what, Mom? Until you get back onto the straight and narrow with Scientology and until you can accept my decision to be a Sea Org member, I can no longer communicate with you. Please do not call me. Please do not write to me. Any communication I receive from you is going to be in you know, basically shredded and I'm not even going to receive it. So please do what's best for me and do not talk to me. I have no interest in communicating with you. So there are just families just ripped apart because Scientology makes you decide between them and your family. And when you think your, fa you know, your spiritual future is at stake, you're going to choose, you know, maybe that route. You may be looking out for yourself. Most people end up, you know, being split between Scientology and their family. In Scientology, there is what's called a suppressive person. And a suppressive person, and basically in like layman's terms, it's a person who's antagonistic to Scientology. They're a person who holds you back in life. Now, a PTS, a potential trouble source, is basically a person who's connected to a suppressive person. So say, for example, you're my father, and you're a suppressive person. That makes me PTS. Now, Scientology basically says that any accidents, injuries, illnesses stem from a PTS condition, which means that if I get sick, it's because I'm around a suppressive person. So in Scientology, they're always trying to find who's the suppressive person. Maybe your stats are down as a staff member. Well, maybe you're connected to someone who's suppressive, or maybe you're a suppressive person yourself. So they're always trying to find who the suppressive person actually is. Now, at the Celebrity Center, if you're an actor and you leave Scientology, they're going to basically tell you that you're not going to work again in the industry. They're going to say, look, you're a suppressive person, and our casting directors, directors, producers, writers, etc., aren't going to work with you anymore, because that will make them PTS. They don't want to hire a suppressive person. They'd rather hire another Scientology actor who's actually working towards bringing Scientology out front into the public. They're not going to want to hire a silly, suppressive person. Now, this is what traps actors, because they feel like, I have to stay in Scientology because this, this is going to ruin my career if I leave the church. I can't leave the church. So these members stay in the church because they feel their career is going to be ruined. When in reality, the amount of industry people in Scientology to me is probably like 5%. But to you as a Scientologist, you feel like it's 100%. And that's what traps actors. There are actually many reasons why I actually left the Church of Scientology. My main reason, of course, was because of their stance on LGBT. 
and I just couldn't put up with being in an organization that just suppresses people and tells them not to be who they are and tries to audit it out of them. So of course that was a really big um, motivating factor for me to leave the Church of Scientology. But also, I did give Scientology one last shot. And last October, November or so of 2012, I did go back for a very short time. I went back for a few days because I was trying to give it another shot. Because I just felt like I was very deeply invested in Scientology. I felt like I invested a lot of money, a lot of time, and I somewhat believed in the philosophy. So I said, well, let me give it one last shot. So as I was leaving the organization out for the night, I saw all these regging cycles going on. There was IS regges surrounding one prisoner, and they just looked like they were just in such panic and terror and fear, and they just didn't want to be in that cycle. There's someone else being regged for money over here to pay for you know, the rest of their Scientology bridge. There's someone over here, and they're talking about donating towards the um, Ideal Org program. So just like in the lobby, as I'm leaving, you're seeing the um, Sea Org members with the money in their eyes, these regs, you see them with the money in their eyes, and you can see how they're manipulating these very vulnerable people. And I had a little bit more strength in me at this time, like I wasn't going to put up with being taken advantage of like I felt I had been through my Scientology experience. So I started realizing and seeing some of the different colors of the organization that I never saw before. I just saw in black and white Scientology was good or bad and I thought it was good. So once I started to question and kind of look around the org a little bit more and read online and talk to other people about their experiences, I started seeing how the organization wasn't legitimate they deviated from their true initial purpose. Now, I'm not saying L. Ron Hubbard was any saint. I'm not saying that the philosophy of Scientology is all good, but there is a difference between the philosophy of the Church of Scientology and the Church of Scientology as a religious organization that's now under control of David Miscavige, which is different. The policies have changed. There's new money-making fundraising schemes going on that shouldn't be going on. There's abuses in the SEA organization. They're abusing their members. They're taking all of their money and bankrupting them. And it's just not a spiritual place to be. So once I realized that it wasn't a spiritual place to be and I could see that there wasn't anything happening in the church that was you know, um, spiritually enlightening to me, I said, you know what, I'm not gonna put up with this. So I quietly departed the Church of Scientology. Then I started getting all the stalking behaviors of them trying to show up at my house, of them calling me and mailing me and doing whatever it can to get me to come back. But they don't see that the Church of Scientology is anything but pure and innocent. So my intention was to start showcasing why this organization shouldn't be supported in its current state. The only way the organization can ever maybe reform is if David Miscavige steps down or if he gets overthrown because then maybe the church can go back to L. Ron Hubbard's basic purpose. Now, of course, there was policies in the church such as being a suppressive person and the gay stance and all those same things. But maybe if the church was able to kind of come back to 2013 and take itself out of 1950 and maybe try to reform itself, maybe it could be a religious organization again and under the Church of Scientology. But until then, the Church of Scientology is not doing what they say they will. They're not delivering what they promise. And until someone decides to step in and try to reform and try to um, take back control of what kind of spiraled out over these last 20, 30 years, ever since David Miscavige has been in power, then it's going to stay the same and I do not support the current Church of Scientology. Now that I left the cult of Scientology, I can have children. I can watch or read the news. I can Google whatever I want. I can have gay friends too. Now that I've left the cult, I can experience unconditional love. I can do yoga. Now that I've left the cult of
Now that I'm out, I can live my life. My life has just completely changed for the better since I left the Church of Scientology. I'm happier than ever. I recently married the love of my life. I have a home, I have two dogs, I own my own business, I'm still pursuing my acting career. I'm just making so many more steps in the right direction. I feel free. I finally have that freedom. And I was seeking that inside the Church of Scientology, but until I left, I wouldn't have actually been able to attain that freedom. To a future we thought would never be 